Hey guys, thanks for listening to Beyond the Tape podcast, a podcast where we focus on people doing rad things in the mountain bike industry. This episode is another tech talk episode where we chat about just general shit to do with the industry in this one. Um, we talk about some new products, stuff we've been riding, a um, few theories on stuff, a bit of World Cup racing. We just have a general chat. It kind of mimics our group chat. Um, sorry for this intro being a little bit average. I am a bit under the weather, not with the COVID. It's just an imitation COVID. The big title sponsor for this episode and for all the tech talks is Lead Out Sports. These guys are one of the leading importers when it comes to quality tools like Abbey Tools, Pedro's, you know, Redshift Sports. They do some cool parts there. Um, Efficient Velo and Elevation Wheelco. I'm actually looking at getting one of the efficient fellow mole finger nipple loaders. This will make my life easier as I keep building wheels. I'm absolutely frothing wheel building at the moment and been doing a bunch of it. So something like the mole finger and then Elevation Wheel Crow's nipple driver will make my life a dream. So head over to Laid Out Sports, check out their web store and grab some rad tools. Also, these guys give 100 bucks worth of Pedro stuff to the best question from every episode. So make sure you get some good questions in via Instagram. Trek is also a major sponsor of this podcast. Now, I don't know if you've been living under a hole for the last few days, but Mike Ross has blown up the internet on his Trek hardtail. That cash roll off a flat drop is absolutely insane. If you haven't seen it, go check out his Instagram. The bike holds up well and without having a solid bike underneath him, I highly doubt he'd be able to get much of this done. So Trek, man, they just have good, actually they have amazing bikes when it comes to full suspension, hard tower, cross country, enduro, downhill, slope style, whatever you want, even road, hit up Trek, get a good bike. NS Dynamics, they are one of the best suspension service companies in the country. Not only do they service suspension, but they sell a bunch of cool stuff as well. I'm actually looking at getting the Olin's TTX coil um, thrown on the slash just to get me a little bit more suppleness off the top, get me a better kind of less breakaway force and just make that bike a little bit smoother in the rear. I can't wait to get one on my bike, um, whether it's a new one or the older one. There's not a huge difference there, but man, the Olin stuff is so damn good. Obviously, when I'm riding my bike, I want to go and ride as many places as possible. And Tasmania is one of my favorite places to ride. The only problem with riding down there is I have to pack my bag, get a plane, organize a pickup from the airport, find accommodation, book lift tickets, do all of that jazz. And it kind of takes the fun out of riding. Thankfully, Taylor Trails can take all of that out of the way for you. You hit them up, tell them what you want to do, and they'll tailor a trail for you and give you the full experience of Tasmania. They can take you to multiple parks over a week. You can go into session one park and get a bit of coaching and a bit of guidance from those guys too so you're not wasting your time trying to find your favorite terror. When I'm riding, I love to wear the franked gear. It is so damn comfortable and so easy just to ride in. Their new rain jacket's killer, but underneath that I often wear the AirTech jersey because it just breathes so damn well and you don't end up feeling like you're wearing a garbage bag here goes my voice it is amazing quality stuff like i've am good at crashing and i've crashed a lot in their kit and haven't had any issues to keep my mud out of the eyes it's nothing better than dirt surfers these guys offer custom designs to basically support your company so if you want a bit of merch or something to promote your company a little bit hit up dirt surfers and i'll do a fully custom design for you Tadler trails actually have one I've got one. There's a bunch of people that use them and they're damn good quality. When I'm off the bike, it's absolutely filthy. Can't be bothered hosing it down, getting everything out. I like to use the waterless wash from Crush. This stuff in the name doesn't need any water. It's a spray on, wipe off, give it a bit of polish, done. Super easy, super quick and I can just jump on the bike the next day really easily. The man keeping my hands warm, as usual, is fist. These gloves are damn comfy. There's nothing better than new glove day. Their gloves fit so damn well. They're super comfortable, and, man, they offer a bunch of grip. So 
jump over there, grab some fresh gloves. Anyway, hitting the five minute mark, long intro. As per usual, grab beer, grab a water, grab a wine, and listen to us three talk absolute junk for the next hour, hour and a half. To uh, the DI2 thing, uh, I guess, is this, uh, is this technically started? No. <laughs> no, okay. Now, the DI2 thing, like everything, all of my concerns got addressed, which is good. That's why I kind of put up the stories because I wanted some interaction because I hadn't seen that question kind of posed before, nor had I seen Shimano discussing it, which if I was Shimano, I would have like um, proactively sort of come out and discuss that so people didn't ask the question, if you know what I mean. Um, and because I That's saw no Shimano. one. Yeah, and because I not, saw no one discussing it, I'm like, is this possibly something that they've missed or like I just didn't understand. So I guess I kind of put it out there hoping that people would um, would chime in to discuss it, which people did, which was really good. Um, and from what I've gathered from mainly from Sean Hughes from Yeti um, is that they've just got really, really intelligent algorithms in the cadence meter and whatever to address that, which I'll be honest with you is surprise. I'm no robotics guy, but it must be really smart because I would have thought, particularly being Shimano and you make brakes, I would have thought it was just easier to plumb sensors into the brakes. But um, yeah, I think my question is a valid one is that if they, if the algorithm wasn't smart enough, is that it certainly could override your, where you could get like a runaway situation easily. Hmm. Accelerometers, uh, like, so they got, I don't know if it's the same to be honest, but like all the power meters that have accelerometers in them, it's similar to yeah. what's in flight attendant as well. Um, yeah. So, and same with like access to railers, right? Like they wake up when you're moving. So, yeah. it kind of makes sense. <laughs> Because it would be a pain in the eye. Like, if you've got a sensor and a brake, it's a whole di- like, unless it's, like, a plug-in system, like, and then you've got to teach mechanics how to bleed it. Like, I can kind of see why they go down that route than having something on the brake. For sure. I mean, I'm happy to admit it's somewhat my naivety of understanding robotics um, because, like, when I think about sort of putting fail-safe measures in, I kind of go to a mechanical system rather than electro mechanical, but um, it's like, it still blows me away that they're able to compute that so quickly. Cause Sean was saying that they've been testing it for quite some time and that they've never had one issue where it feels like it's overriding the rider, mm. um, which is fucking pretty cool because um, I mean, I think the way they've executed that is really intelligent because um, obviously changing gears without pedaling is is really cool, um, but there are some situational drawbacks by having a chain always rotating. So I think mm. their ability to have an intermittently rotating chain just to pull enough through to change is really, really clever. Obviously, it's kind of limited to e-bikes, um, but... Um, yeah, it's really clever that because my mind just went straight to the fact of like, yeah, you go down a hill really quick on the brakes and it wanting to turn would be effectively trying to accelerate you, but you're trying to decelerate the bike. Um, but, yeah, it knows not to shift in that circumstance, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty sick. I think, yeah. I think yeah, like, yeah, I, I saw that and I was like, this is a good application to like, not the way I ride or anyone I know rides, but to a very big market. Because, like, you'd see it a lot all the time, Darren. Like, people don't know how to use gears. No. Yeah. Um, the, the the one that, that Dave Habich brought up, which I thought was a really good one, and, again, like, and something I've tried to kind of make known even kind of in this podcast is, like, you know, obviously design and make bike parts and, have an engineering background, but I'm not a bike mechanic. Like, I've never worked as a bike mechanic. So, of course, I've wrenched on my own bikes, but 
just the prevalence of stuff that you would see as a bike mechanic. Um, yeah, and, and he brought up, he's like, dude, yeah, people, the, the most common type of people that buy e-bikes don't necessarily know how to ride. So they would change gears like under power, like under motor assist and just fuck out gears super quick. And um, his main point was why he reckons it's so good is because, yeah, you're not shifting under that pedal assist mode all the time and not just chewing out chewing out transmission stuff, which I yeah. think is a good point. Well, there's two things as well. Like, yeah, like a lot of e-bike customers just leave it in the 10 or the 11 and just pedal around all the time, which wears out yep. really, really, really quick. Um, but then oh, what was I going to say? What was the other point with that? Fuck, yeah, my brain's not my brain to say it. Yeah, like, yeah, like those e-bike customers are not, they're not traditional mountain bikers. And then, like, even more to that point, like on the, um, I think it still says it on the Access app, like if you're setting up your shifting, I think it recommends for e-bikes specifically, you keep it at one click per click on the shifter. Yes, so not you like don't, a click. Yeah, so you can't like yep. leave your hand down on it because like same thing, right? Like someone leaves their hand down on the on the paddle, or the controller, or whatever you want to call it, and then and then two hundred and fifty watts of a motor plus their two hundred watts goes through. Then that derailleur's coming off second best. So yeah, it's probably it's probably even in Shimano's <laughs> interest of of grey warranties to do that. Oh, definitely. I I would definitely assume so. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I think it's uh, it was kind of cool. I, like like I said, I kind of um, I put that out there because I wanted some clarification on it, um, and seemed seemed to get it, which was which was good. I think that they're on onto a good thing there for sure. I suppose also the system knows the speed, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, from the disc rotor. Yeah, that's so right. you can't. Yeah, the more I think about it, it makes sense. Hmm. Cool. And Sick. look, he's got a new bike. Are we allowed to talk about that? I'm just testing a bike at the moment, which is cool. But I got some new bits on it, which is sick. Um, just testing a bike. Yeah, just testing a bike out at the moment. It's good. Yeah. I thought um, it was in for service course. I can't. I yeah, can't it's got, it, got, it got built here. And now I'm having a bit of a <laughs> swing around on it, which is sick. But, um, yeah, man. Like, uh, I suppose like there's two a couple things I want to talk about. Like, I think before all that, the coolest thing is, um, which I found out this week, is Trailhead. And the only reason I bring it up with this is because um, it has a coil on it. This bike, and the coil is actually Rockshock makes a one six five dash one ninety eye to eye coil shock now, which mm-hmm. they've never done before. And, and I don't know of any other brands that do, but to be honest, I don't dabble in a lot of other brands. So there probably is 17 other ones that I just haven't ever seen before. But it's a very little shock. I was explaining to mm. one of the guys at the shop the other day. I was like, he was on a, uh, a blur. And I was like, this shock would fit into your bike. And he was like, oh, shit, <laughs> it is little. So um, the first thing with that was, is there's no springs out for that shock yet that I can see. Mm. There's nothing in the spare parts manual. And I tried a 185 spring and it, um, it didn't sit nicely. I could just get the collar down and it wasn't great. Um, so I was trying to figure out spring rate. That's a pain in the ass. There's so many different calculators on the web and they're still the same calculators I used like 15 years ago. Mm. I think I ended up using Mojo in the end and there was like one other one. It's like the same thing. Um, and I was like, surely there's better spring calculators out of this. Anyway, Trailhead now does rear shocks for a rock shock. Um, which is really cool. So you can key your sag in it until you get just a good baseline set up. Yep. Um, the spring for that was actually bang on, which was sweet in the end because the two websites I was on, it was either a 525 or a 565, but they're real specific. Um, and I got a 550 and the Rockshock ran at a 550. So anyway, I was pretty stoked on that. And then big shout out to Nigel in um, Medina for having an SAR spring because SAR springs actually fit. Um, he just machined me down a little pom for it so the back thing can spin around, which is pretty sick. But, um, yeah, like a coil on a little bike 
and the bike I'm on is possibly the most linear bike you can buy. So I was like, this coil is going to be really interesting because it's probably going to bottom out a lot, but it has this hydraulic bottom out, like a little purple thing. And I probably could have taken the shock out and shown everyone, but I'm sure you've seen it. If not, I've got it on my Instagram, clicking all the dials and shit. But um, the hydraulic bottom out feature in that shock is nuts. So I went out for a ride on Saturday and had it all the way off, which is no hydraulic bottom out support. And I was bottoming for like a lot. You know what I mean? And, and yep. not super, super harsh. It actually seems to feel a lot better than I thought it would, but a lot, right? And then I just went up and up and up and up till it was max and worked my way back. It is freaking gnarly. Like, you're still using your travel, but it just eases it in so much. Like, it, it it's literally like, I wouldn't say I hate the term bottomless, but it felt bottomless. Like, I knew I was towards in my travel, so it wasn't bottomless, but there was no yep. harsh bottom outs on a 120 mil travel coil on a bike that shouldn't have a coil on it. Like, yeah, it's yeah. fucking sick. So um, that's pretty cool. And then obviously it's got all the, all the HSC, LSC stuff. And it's good because it is so short a stroke. Um, and with the hydraulic bottom out to actually have the high speed compression to be able to adjust that, I kind of find matching that up made the bottom out feel a bit less harsh. Like I know hydro, uh, HSC is not, at the end of the stroke, but it seems so maybe because the stroke's so short, it does seem to yeah. taper it in even more. So that was sick. And then the new pike is tripping me out, and it was the same thing with the with the um, with the Zeb. I noticed it more on the pike, um, and I don't know what you or take his dad's, but the fork. It sounds really counterintuitive. The fork feels slow. It makes me feel like I'm riding really slow, and I couldn't mm. put my finger on it because I was like riding with a couple of boys who ride it Sylvan all the time and they weren't going full gas, but they weren't chilling either. And I was pretty much keeping up with them going down, but I was like, fuck, this thing feels slow. Like, what the fuck? And I think it's the buttercup. Mm. I think taking the vibration out of your hands, like I think for me going fast in my head is like getting rattled and I mm. wasn't getting rattled. So I'm like, oh, the bike's really slow. Like the fork feels amazing. The thing that's another trip is it's quiet and because it's so quiet, like, I keep thinking the damp has blown up and the damp is sweet. Mm. But yeah, it's really interesting. Like it feels slow, um, yeah. but not in a bad way. Like you're not riding slow. Yeah. I get that feeling. Yeah. Mm. Cause you like almost judge your speed by your contact points and your eyes. And 100%. Like your contact points are now just like gone. It, yeah. Especially in corners. Like yeah. high vibration corners are where I noticed it the most. Like yeah. it just feels dreamy. It's it's crazy. So um, yeah, that was really cool. Like it was, I I I noticed it on the Zeb before, but there's it didn't make me feel slow. I think mm. maybe because the pike's a smaller fork, it's more it's even more noticeable. But um, yeah, man. Like I'd even think about going to carbon bars again to try them out because I'm not getting that feedback in my hands that I would traditionally, especially on a pike. Um, yeah, so, yeah, anyway, it's it's sick. Like, it's a fun little bike. It's heavy. It's, like, 15 kilos at the moment. But I didn't realise that, so I've got it, I've built this bike up to do um, Lake Mountain, which is, like, an hour, hour 15 downhill, uphill kind of ride. Like, it's almost like three enduro stages with three liaisons in a lap down here. And I kind of want to get the KOM on it and the bike for that's like a 120, 130. So that's what this was built for. <laughs> so I use the three zeros because it's like I don't want to get pinch flats and I don't want to get a flat. Because if you're halfway into an hour like lap and I get a flat, I'm going to be salty. But those zip motor wheels, they're two kilos for the set. I didn't realize like they're really, really heavy. And I got double down in the back and exo plus the front. <laughs> Like, I could cut a whole bunch of weight and get rid of those, but I'm trying to look for a lighter set of uh, wheels at the moment just to pedal around on and then have those for, for that. Mm. So, yeah, it's the rear the center hub on there, which is sick. I just need to get a DT hub in the back because I keep snapping zip ties and the thing keeps like the rear free hub ends up engaging, which I don't, not engaging, which I don't like. Yeah. But the quietness, like, same thing with that fork being so quiet. Like mm. the bike is silent, like proper silent, like World Cup dream quiet. You know what I mean? I think like yeah, a lot of um, a lot of customers say the same 
thing is like obviously they like the front freewheeling capability and whatever, but the thing that they're most impressed with is just the silence, which is kind of cool. I like that too. I'm just so used mm. to it. I guess I don't think about it, but um, yeah, the silence is sick. So like I love a quiet bike on a good day, but I also are fond of a loud free hub. You know, I mean, so everything quiet is at the free hub. So mm. I thought it'd be a bit, a bit wild, but um, nah, man, like I love it. It's sick. I just took it off on Sunday because I got a 36. The only chain ring I was 36 too, but no, I can kill my legs on the Saturday. So, yeah, um, yeah, I got yeah. a 34 on. But um, the only thing I hate, I fucking hate about it, is I jumped on my roadie on Sunday and I started shifting when I was coasting. <laughs> Dude, like, honestly, honestly, put one on your roadie if you, if it'll fit. I want to. Um, I don't think it won't fit. You have to go real custom with it. Is it because, like, the bottom bracket, it won't fit over the bottom bracket? Oh, it probably – oh, I don't know, actually. It's – it's a really big shell looking at it. It's T47. Um, Any, anyway, I don't know if it's that. It's smaller chain rings. And I need a power meter because obviously if I had uh, a yeah. power meter off, yeah, I can't ride my bike. Like, I, um, I mean, I like it on both. But on the roadie, I really, really like it because I'm not much of a roadie. But, like, I, I really enjoy going for a road bike ride. Um, but, like, I hate... I hate riding in traffic and that type of stuff. So, like, the shifting gears without pedaling thing, it, for me, is really comforting on the road because I don't have to worry about if there's traffic or if I come to a red light, I can just bang down and and stuff like that. But more so, like you were saying, with the the silence, is that on the roadie, there's literally nothing, which is, um, mm. which is really nice. Um, but – and I also think that um, – I don't know, like the silence, the instant engagement, whatever, on the roadie, everything just kind of seems seamless. Like on mountain biking, there's a lot of stuff with delays. Like you've got suspension, so when you pedal, it kind of sags, like all that type of stuff. But for me, everything just seems so responsive with it on the roadie. I, I really, really like it. Oh, dude, I'm keen. Like that um, that frame fell through at like the last minute for doing um, handmade. That's a hundred percent the goal for next year. Like that crit, I want to make ultimate crit bike one by. Yep. Like the whole idea for that is obviously I want to do like a weird through axle windbreak thing. But the thing that came to mind straight away was when you're when the WRB came out. I was actually more excited about the setup for that than I was for the mountain. That's <laughs> funny um, because it's perfect, right? Like it's such a cool thing, especially in like criteria. But I hate to get all roadie on a mountain bike podcast, but like. You know, you can just shift out of the corner and <laughs> then you're good to go. You know, you're not some dude yeah. striking your pedal like eating shit in the last bend. Like, yeah. Definitely. Like, I've had a fair few people buy them for, um, for cyclocross. Yeah. Mm. Which, uh, which I get. I've never even watched a cyclocross race in person. I mean, but um, I definitely see how it could be good. Yeah. I've done a couple. Yeah. But I'd love to say that would help me, but nothing's going to help me in that sport. It's so hard. <laughs> If you, but, uh, what's the quote I've heard? Like, if you can't taste your heart at the back of your throat, you know, racing cyclocross properly. <laughs> yeah, dude, you're in the red for like an hour. It's fine. It's, it's actually, <laughs> I hate it. Like, I like crit racing because I sit in and then just try and do shit at the end. But, but mm. yeah, so, um, yeah, Senna Hub is sick. I like it. Um, yeah, I was, I was coming to get a DT. I was like, I was going to do it straight up and just get my three zeros built into a, um, do a DC with the um, one guy at the local shop was keen enough to build it, but I'm just saving my pennies at the moment. So I'll wait till I've saved pennies and then get it done. And then uh, if I get a lightweight wheel set, then it'll have, I'll just probably get other of those off you, make and chuck it in both and off we go. Yep. Sweet. Sick. Fuck yeah. Yeah. yeah already, down country. Uh, in. As you've seen, I'm already on to the next one. But that's, yeah, that's, well, that's, kind of, that's the one I'm real keen on. Jellyfish. Yeah, I'll test that for you if you want. Yeah, I know. No worries, I think I will definitely test it for you. You're an e bike guy. You're an e bike guy now, aren't you? Yeah. No, not full e bike. Not yet. <laughs> How not is yet. your How's your ring? You've got. And honestly, I was talking about it with a few of the guys that went up to review it. So we had a we had a press camp, which was weird to be a part of. Um, and we all got the bikes, and we're all just like, we can't fault the thing. Mm. Like it is. For what it is designed to do, it's so sick. So I'm talking about that fuel exe, um, just like a lightweight 
e-bike trail bike i think it's like 19 kilos yeah the weight sounded sick i was reading a lot about it because i i worked at trek shop for years i'm a, I'm a big trek fan but um i think it makes like i've only ridden heavy e-bikes I, and i love heavy e-bikes you know what i mean but i think lighter weight e-bikes sound better <laughs> you know I mean? like, they do but like i've ridden an sl yeah. And no, no shit against specialized, but the 30 newton meters was ass. Like, yeah, it was okay. just like because the weight was extra. Yeah. It negated itself. Yeah. And is that a 50 in the track? The track's 50. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a little bit more and it's just enough to kind of make it worth it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is it's just dead silent. So their big thing for this was something they called tonality. And something I 100% agree with. Um, so, like, and again, this comes down to that center hub chat that you were just having. It's just that mm. silence. So, you have that yep. little drone with any e bike that zzz, yep. Mm. Yep. fucking does my head in. Does my head yeah. in. Yeah. Flow did a really good, like, um, not to talk about another media outlet, but Flow did a really no, good Flo comparison. Yeah, yeah, with the sound. And um, it was really good. Like, Will did it. And, um, I thought it was really well done, like just to show you the noise. And yeah, I was gobsmacked with like how quiet it was. Cause yeah, same thing. Like I, I don't get annoyed by you like sounds. I'm used to them, but like they, they always have a noise, you know? Mm. And yeah, it's just quiet, man. Like it's sick. So. And when they said and, it would be quiet, I'm like, bullshit. Like whatever. Yeah. What did you, but yeah. like there was times where I forgot I was riding an e-bike and I just felt like I was actually fit again. Yeah. Cause it's so quiet. Yep. And that's 150, 140. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right? Good travel length. Because that's the thing I'm always worried about. Like, I was going to get a Motera and chuck a Zeb and a coil on it. I was like, that thing's going to be like 25 kilos, which is sweet. Like, it's a bit of cross training, but like, it's so different to a normal bike. Like, it's so, mm. so different. Whereas, mm. at least with those, like, they're a downhill bike from 10 years ago, really, in terms of weight. Like, it's nothing crazy. Um, and you're not going to tuck your front end and completely die. No. So, yeah. And it, I mean, like, you definitely know the good thing about bigger gear bikes is just the traction. Like, yeah. you could have a small baby in front, like, a small microwave in front of you, and you just roll through the fucking thing. Yeah. Like, it just goes through it, but it can kind of take the fun out of riding. Well, and I think also as a cross training tool, like, you're not, you know, if I, if you went to then use those skills or practice on your normal bike, you'll just die. <laughs> like, yeah. Whereas it's something lighter, like with what you're talking, with what you're, yeah. No, I'm a fan. I think this. I think that's fucking sick. That I'm yellow just, was awesome. Like you're on the yeah. yellow one, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. The one they're not bringing in to the yeah, country. Yeah, it's like think. all yeah. the good, all the good shit. It's like lyric access and yeah. Access. So we counted it. It's got nine batteries. Um, yeah. Because it's got the access dropper, uh, mech. Then it's got tire whiz front and rear. And then it's got their air whiz. Okay. Air whiz, yeah. Built in shock whiz. Which is sick. Um, yeah. Is it cool. full shock whiz? Like, I haven't actually played with it. I've only seen the app. I haven't um, fully looked at it yet. Yeah. Okay. To be honest with you, I've just been yeah. too busy riding the bike and having a ton of fun. So, um, yeah. That, like, honestly, it's blown me away. Mm. And that's um, got a little, that's got the H bit, the hydraulic bottom out. Super deluxe air as well, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 which is good because I run 31, 32% on that bike. Yeah. Um, with no tokens. And it feels like it's got a couple of tokens in it, which is cool. Yeah, sick. That's good. Um, oh, being honest, I only just realized I had a high speed compression thing on it the other day because it's so hidden away. It's so hidden, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, that's there. That's what I found is a little bit annoying, like with my bike because so you need a um you need a three mil ball head for where it's situated mm. and which no multi-tool fits into which is fine i'm just going to cut down a little ball head but yeah that was the only one downside i, was like, I just wish there was a little dial on it like just a little mm. uh. um but no like honestly those buttercups oh, and okay. hydraulic bottom out are game changing the buttercups yeah. are by far the biggest change. Like, sure, the dampen is better and it's definitely quieter and stuff, but you just notice, like, especially on that, because you can just yeah. pedal up hills as well and your railing corners uphill. Like, yeah. you notice it just not, you don't feel anything. It's sick. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when I rode Dylan's, he was like, it's damper 
And I was like, oh, okay, like, and which I like believed in, but like the more I write it now, I'm like, I, I don't think, like, I think the Jap is obviously playing a role, don't get me wrong. And I've actually, mm. I've actually ended up, I backed off all my low speed and it feels, it feels awesome, um, which is surprising because normally I run quite a bit of low speed. But um, I just reckon it's all on that buttercup. Like, it's, yeah. It definitely feels more Euro, whereas it's more dampening over Air Spring now. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. Did you um, so, check out the motor? exploded diagram thing i think i sent you mick with like the ring drive and stuff no no <laughs> are you busy or something you making parts or something you yeah i've been in your lane too much i did see it and i'm like uh and the other thing is like i like don't get me wrong like i'm stoked on on all bikes um i really i really am but i'm not much of an e-bike guy either like i'm i'm all for people using them and I reckon they certainly have a place in the market, but I'm also mean like from my side of things, like again, back to the conversation that I guess I chimed in on earlier, earlier on is that like, I'm not like, I'm not an electromechanical guy. I kind of suck at robotics. Mm. I just think of things sort of mechanically. So um, yeah, I saw the drawings had a bit of a look, but it's not a, it's not a space that, my company is kind of willing to compete in mainly if I, maybe if I employ like a gun electromechanical guy, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not planning to take on Shimano or Bosch anytime soon. <laughs> Why not? Have you ridden many, have you ridden many e-bikes yourself? Well, you want to know a funny story. I've only ridden one ever. Yeah. And um, it was at a national DH race at Awala. Yeah. And yeah. uh I left some tools in the van or something along those lines. And one of my mates goes and he's like, Oh, just take my e-bike. So I jumped on and went up to the van, came back. Mind you, this is like 2017. So like so it's been a while ago. E- e-bikes have come a long way since then, put it that way. And I gave it back to him. And I'm like, dude, like I'm not riding this thing anymore. Cause it's too good. Like if I ride this anymore, <laughs> I'll never have a normal bike again. I've yeah, always man. done the same. I think the biggest limiting factor is just like, don't get me wrong, I spent a lot of money on bikes, but I just, they're expensive. <laughs> and for me, it's a second bike, whereas for most riders, it's probably their primary bike. Like for me, like I'm a, I don't know, I guess like I'm a purist at heart with riding bikes. And I think that's why I still like having to roll on BMX and whatever, because that's like the purest one of the purest forms of riding, like no suspension. B brakes, you know. Um, but I don't know. Like I ride a fair bit of moto, and just where my head's at, it, I'm like, fuck. If I'm going to go drop 25k on an e bike, mm-hmm. I'd rather drop. I'd rather drop less than 10, and you get a fucking good moto, and you can go anywhere. The cost is crazy, man. No pedal power. <laughs> we have we have an intern at, at PS of the moto who's rad, and um. Yeah. He's not, he's from tennis, which is also interesting. I'm not going to rather hold tennis, but like, I did not realize you could do so much shit to rackets. But anyway, he, uh, I was like, Hey, I'll just give you a few websites to go look at and see what the kind of prices are. <laughs> and he's yeah. looking on the specialized website. He was like, Holy shit, this one's 24,000. <laughs> so he found, he found the Creo first, which was 21, I think. And he's like, Holy shit, it's 21,000. And I was like, Yeah. And I'm like, But I'm like, that's for 24, you get the Levo. And you get a fork, <laughs> you get a shock, you get a dropper post. Like the other one, you just get an e-bike, an e-road bike or gravel bike. <laughs> and he's like, oh, shit. Or yeah, it's it it crazy. Spend 20 I, on like an Epic without yeah. a motor. Oh, yeah. And you get less travel. Yeah, I have to, I don't know. I don't don't want to start a conversation or like rail any up, one up or anything like that. But like. You really have to do ask why e-bikes are worth so much money. And yeah. I think it's not because of the money to produce the e-bike. It's more so tar- like their target audience. They know that the people who are buying the e-bikes are predominantly more cashed up middle-aged people. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't know. I know there's money in the tech, but like, you know, you can buy – top of the range downhill bike just for round number sake say t- say 10 grand um i'm i struggle to believe there's an extra 15 grand just in the motor it would be a lot to do with um transport as well 
Yeah, uh, like shipping is a big one. Like, those shipping those batteries is like shipping fuel yeah. when it comes to danger. So it's not and cheap. It's like the quantity of motors. Like there's not a lot of motor manufacturers and there's a lot, not a lot of motors. Like that's another big part with it. Like mm. I definitely see where the cost goes. I'm not going to get down the specialized rack because I think specialized and people are going to hate me if they don't listen to specialized are really, really overpriced. But like that's their price and position in their marketing mix, you know, which is fine to go yeah. for that premium price point. But yeah, like for me and kind of seeing some of the costings of the stuff, the costs do add up for most of them. But when they are those pro- brands that are priced premiumly, it's very, very, very different. But the other thing too, right, if anything's carbon, right, like that's a whole new mold straight up for that bike, you yeah. know, and, and all the R&D and all that kind of stuff is, is only pretty recent and, and I'm sure they'll start to go down a little more. And once a few more motor people come into the equation, it'll probably be good. But, yeah, but yeah, Specialized is different. Specialized is, yeah, they're premium. I shouldn't be mean. They're, they're just, that's how they price their product, like, so, I will say, like, yeah, I, again, like, I'm not an e-bike expert. I mean, I only sort of see see what's been sold. Like, you know, I, a lot of specialised, mainly because I get hit up questions about aftermarket stuff that, in fact, mm-hmm. doesn't fit the e-bike models. But um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not across the product range of all brands to really chime in on the e-bike front. But um, it, yeah, it's a in any case, it is a lot of money to be dropping on a bicycle. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. I think, um, I'll say, yeah. when I got this thing, when we first rode it, we're like, oh, okay, sick, 20 grand, 24 grand bikes again. But I think the top speed spec they bring into Oz is only like 13. Yeah. I was looking at the prices and I was and like, these are actually pretty decent. It kind of blew me away. Yeah. I think the one arm on was going to be around 15, Okay, yeah. which is pretty good. Considering, like it's access and everything, yeah. Mm. I, I think that whole light e bike, and I, and I think Trek's probably just going to cream it on that front. Um, that's the that is the perfect e bike for beginners. Like, I was listening to that out of collective with Geordie, and he has some very um, <laughs> different opinions yeah. to me on e bikes. So I, I quite like them, I do appreciate what he means in terms of them being you know throwaway items because they kind of are, but I don't hate it for that, but um. I think the problem is, and I've been caught up saying this too with a lot of new riders, if they're not fit, you know, it's like, oh, just go get an e-bike. And it's like someone on a 24-kilo e-bike can get into a fucking lot of trouble real fucking quick if they don't know what they're doing. Mm. If you're on something that's at least a little bit lighter, a little bit less power, you know, I think that's going to be the way to go. And I think that market's going to just, that'll be where e-bikes kind of end up. And then those big e-bike things will be, you know, the downhill Mm. bikes of, of 10 years ago. I'm keen to see how the E MTB World Champs and stuff go again this year. Be interesting to see what people are riding, like the World Champs. The only reason I'm interested in E mountain biking racing, this sounds so me, is because of Josh Carlson. True. Josh Carlson is a fucking legend, and but I don't think I know anyone else who does it properly. Um, I know Win Masters does that every now and then, and then yeah. Uh, maybe a couple of the older dudes, but I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just not. Yeah, I'm not like I said. I'm in the racing for Carso, mm. and I and I, and I rate Carso as a human, and I think it's cool. But aside from him, I like I don't know. It's just it's so weird. There's so much in the engines, and they're all so different at the moment that I don't think it sounds weird. Like it's it's not fair. I no, think. I totally agree with you. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I um I just had the presumption when I was talking to Carl So at, at Medina and that, like I just had the presumption from any other form of racing that um, that the e-bike motor would be regulated. Yeah. You know, it's like, I mean, like go-karts, mm. for example, you know, they've got the, the paint on the case. Like you have to send it back to Rotex or whatever to, to get it rebuilt. Um, I'm not saying like I was presuming it's going to be at that level, but I at least thought it would be, standardized or something but yeah like i was blown away to learn that is that it's unregulated yeah and then to hear like you know you've got a 
this is from Casa, I don't mind me sharing it, you know, but like essentially you just got to lose a lot of weight so you can go up the hills faster to win. Like, you yeah. know, I don't know, it's not the be all and end all of the descending, but I just feel the descending should be coming into play more than the up stuff. And if the up stuff is in the stages and it's coming down to the fact that it's just power versus weight, then obviously there's going to be a certain type of rider that's going to go better in that field, which I think is, yeah. you know, a bit unfair. I don't know. Like Casa has got so much power and he's a heavy guy, but that goes – that actually is counterintuitive to what he's trying to do because the motor would cut out. True. Mm. Yeah. I never thought of that. Maybe that's why he was trying to trying to lose weight before nationals. He, I think he was. That's what he was yeah. talking to me about. He's like, dude, he's like, I'm just hungry all the time. I was like, I'm like, what the fuck are you going to lose weight from though? Like he's, yeah. what, like 12 kilos? He's I think I saw him at Cannonball and then I saw him at nationals again. I can't know. There was a gap of a certain, maybe I saw him in the Fredbear round and he was like in the leaning phase. And he's like, yeah, I can get to about this, but I can't get too much more than that. And then for our house, it's like, fuck me, man. Like, yeah. Anyway. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It, I think, yeah, I think it could be better. I'm excited to what see. Like I'm excited that Yeti's putting a lot of focus into it. Um, it's super exciting. Obviously like the Shimano engineers are working really closely with them, which is cool. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. The racing side's a bit, a bit, a bit weird. On another mm. topic, we had a listener question come in wondering what the hell's in the water at your place, Mick, because you just broke the internet like a third time. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I'll say, I'll say from the get go, like I'm not just trying to be humble or anything. Like it's really hard for me to look at objectively. Like I'm just distracted being in my workshop as a single man <laughs> with nothing else to do but fuck around with both there's only so two things hard. you can have your hands on and you're doing the most productive one right you well, clearly yeah. finished the internet a long time ago yeah <laughs> no so i don't know i yeah you know, it's hard for me to look at objectively because i'm just here doing it like i don't, I don't but yeah if, if it's well received then that's then that's cool i um i'm presuming you're talking about the gearbox thing yeah and then when you put that video up of the new center hub that you're working on, I had about yeah. 50 people message me asking how it works. Don't I've had so many expected people, me to know, but I've yeah. had so many people message me and go, you've just put a bearing there and there's no clutch. And I'm like, yeah, right. Oh, fuck it. That's what I'll do. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> that might be a bit aggressive, but like, Man, <laughs> that's like, the most really, offensive I've ever seen you be. <laughs> do you really think that I would just put a bearing, just a ball bearing there and take all the clutch mech out and just spin it around? And, I, like, I refer them to the first video where it goes back, forward, and then I crank and it's engaged. But, oh, man, like, yeah. Anyway, I think some people just try to row you up. But, yeah, that, that was the first one. I've been working on that one for a little while and then kind of figured out how to do it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really cool. Like, I think that's, um, yeah, I don't know. It's really cool. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, the gearbox thing will be really good as well. That kind of surprised me if I'm honest with you, because, um, I don't know, it just kind of fell out one day, like just kind of fell out of my brain onto the CAD screen and. I think that's always the way things go. And it's like the the two directional center hub thing as well is like um, not saying it's simple, but um, I don't know. The, the more refined ideas are quite often more simple than their predecessor. And I think it's like anything like with moto or cars or whatever, it's like, um, you kind of wonder how that didn't come first, like the simpler option kind of came first. But I think with adva- inv- like advancements with technology and machining capability and all that type of stuff, that wasn't like – I'll use the example of like pneumatic valves, like Koenig's egg do like pneumatic valves, for instance. So you get like a square valve opening profile and – you're like, how the fuck did no one come up with pneumatic valves? Like, you know, that's more simple than um, like a push rod or a cam driven valve, whatever. But the thing is like, whatever it is, like the machining capability might not have been there or whatever. Um, 
and even say with this gearbox stuff, like 3D printers, as an example, has just made it so easy. Like this would have been impossible to make pre-3D print, or at least impossible for me because I like to stick around with things and make something and see it, see the flaws in it and just sort of, dare I say, kind of mistake my way to success, like just make shit and it's like, oh, well, um, uh, kind of, yeah, like the law of subtraction type thing, like mm-hmm. make a whole bunch of shit, shit and try to cut out your mistakes or just try to, make it a bit better. So yeah, this one, like this gearbox is far, far simpler than anything else that I've like any other like quote unquote gearbox reiteration I've tried to do. Um, but at the same time, like kind of complicated to come up with the concept or think of it, but in actual fact, simpler than any of the ones, um, before. So, um, anyway, yeah, it's kind of exciting. It's still a fair way off as far as like it works. Um, but where I want to take it is even further, um, which I think will be really good. Like there's no, um, there's no reason why like in the the current one that you see why we can't get 500% range out of it, which will be really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other idea that I had the other day, which I want to do is, kind of limit the the cable coming in from the outside um and there's another mechanical way that i can do that which is really cool that i only thought of the other day um to to keep everything internal like the cable coming in from the outside is is fine but i think aesthetically like if it just came straight down and and into the box i think that'd be really cool um and then yeah obviously extend the range out more than just a six speed. Um, And then ideally I'd like to make, and I had a couple of discussions today with a few people, but like, uh, like a carbon Kevlar box, I think that'd be really cool. Uh, Mm. But yeah, anyway, I I struggle to kind of talk about my own things, but if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to. Can you do like a titanium box that every time I crank case, a rock it just sends mad sparks up into the air, like full F1 <laughs> style. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where I'm going to get the budget from to make a titanium case, but <laughs> you sell head stems, man. We know you're loaded. Come on. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm like, this is like just more of your shit, Mick, but like, it's fucking awesome you're around. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's fucking awesome. It's in Melbourne. Like, just, I don't know. It's just, I love. I don't know whether you call it or not, but like that whole continuous improvement, like you're always tinkering with stuff and like, I'm like, similar in other ways. Yeah. Like I don't make shit. I just tinker with other people's shit the whole time. But like, I know it's really appreciated, but it's crazy that like, there's this brand that's in Melbourne, like mm. near where I fucking live that does all of this cool stuff. Like same thing with the fucking stem. It's like, Hey, I've got this idea for a stem. And then like, you made the stem. <laughs> like when, no, no, like, when yeah. like, like I always have crazy ideas that shit. I had a book of it. I remember once I was season, like you actually made that, like it's a living, <laughs> breathing, working thing. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, that's the coolest bit. Like, and because I think you are humble and quiet about a lot of things too. Like, Stuff just come like you've just got stuff done. Like, where the fuck did that come from? Like, the center <laughs> hub when that came out, you like already had a video done, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, what? Like, what? What? <laughs> like, when did this happen? So, no, nah, it's awesome, dude. Like, it's so cool. Like, it just gets me stoked. So, no, I, I like, yeah, I really appreciate it. Like, I, yeah, I, I kind of I struggle with that type of stuff, but like, and like. Without trying to fucking make it a downer or a downer conversation or whatever, but like I do, like big time, I think struggle with like imposter syndrome type thing. Like I just, um, I don't know. I think that's maybe why I keep coming up with more parts is because I a lot of the time, like I'm like, oh, what the fuck am I doing? Like I don't know whether this is, you know, I I don't know. But but people seem to get stoked on it, and that makes me stoked. So. And yeah. like, I just like riding bikes and like riding stuff. So that's that's cool. That makes me stoked. I ran Stu for four years. And even now with YouTube stuff, I still have imposter syndrome that like, why the fuck am I teaching people how to do mechanic stuff? Like, oh, yeah. I think a lot of people get it, especially in the bike industry, because I think like 
in a lot of ways, like you're working in your passion, you know what I mean? And, and I always assume it's like these really smart to people and they are, they are there, but like, I kind of like hide them away is like never going to get to that level. But like, to yeah. be honest, like probably not that far away from those people. Not that I'll be those people, but yeah, it is interesting. The imposter syndrome, mm. I totally get, dude. I'm the same, man. Yeah. yeah, dude, yeah. You, should have tried, <laughs> you should have been me at this press camp. <laughs> I was like, what the <laughs> fuck am I doing here? <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's important to stay grounded to like not, mm. not just being an up yourself dickhead because then you might get a bit, bit away on yourself. But yeah, at the end of the day, like, but, but, I, but I think that's like with you and, our, and I, Lockie, I think like, I don't know, um, or like all of us, but we just enjoy riding our bike. Like we're not trying to mm. – become anything or be anyone that we're not or whatever. Like I just mm. love riding my bike and love everything that the bike riding scene has given me. Um, and that's just, that's all it is. Just want to be mm. authentic about it and make cool stuff. But I think like, you like, like making cool shit too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I also think that, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, if, um, your idea can be great, but if you never actually make it, then it's pretty well jack shit. Like, doesn't mm. as mm. as as blunt as that sounds. Like, and oh, fuck, this is going down a rabbit hole. Darren, <laughs> we we need to rename the podcast. But like, I think with the whole social media thing as well, is that these days it's so easy for people to have a persona of kind of a shit talker mm. and not actually create a physical product. Yeah. Whereas, and like, again, I don't want to talk shit or be harsh or whatever, but like, um, you know, like even the social media craze with videos and stuff like that, like obviously a lot of pros put out fucking sick videos, but then there's a lot of say, even in the writing scene, like overinflated stuff on the internet um whereas i guess my whole ethos with it is like you know if i come up with a good idea and don't actually make it then then kind of the imposter syndrome would set in even worse you mm. know what i mean like if you come up with the idea i i, I get messages from people and they're like oh i had that idea 10 years ago and it's like like I'm stoked you had the idea. I, I, I'd never <laughs> knock anyone, whatever. But at the same time, I'm like, well, some people kind of try to knock you for it. Like, oh, I had that idea, piss off type thing. And you're like, well, did you ever actually make it, or did you sit there and just think about it? Like, but clearly, I mean, like you obviously bypassed their tinfoil hat and took the shit out of their brain, right? So it's definitely your fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. look at their Instagram and they're 15 years old, and like, I had that idea 10 years ago, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Preschool. But yeah, yeah it's I, hilarious. Like, I think it's I think it's really important to, and it's like anything, like you know what it's like, Lockie. Like if you, I don't know, yeah, if you've always dreamt of going and racing a World Cup or something, just go and do it. Like, mm. it's not. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, and that's it. the thing. And I sound like a fuckhead when I say it. Like, I hate it. Like, trying to someone the other day and like, oh, I just want to go. I can't remember what it was. Go fucking race something. I was like, go do it. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like. Like, if you want to do it, you can do it. You may not be able to win. Like, that's a different kind of, But you can go do the thing. Like, you know, it's, yeah. not, it's the same with, like, being a mechanic. It's like people are telling, like, how do you how you can mechanic? And you're like, I've fucked up a lot of shit. And then I figured out how to not fuck it up. Like, that's that's honestly, like, that's how, how I started mechanicing. Like, I bought, I bought an orange 223 and I learned how to put it together. I broke probably half the parts and then <laughs> bought new ones and couldn't afford to buy a third set. And, and but yeah, it just comes down to like a, the Nike slogan is right. Like just do it. I think it's a massive, well, also a massive think, part like, of it. Back, back to the thing about, well, I don't know, like doing things for the right reason or trying to be humble about it, not being a cocky dickhead. But I feel as though like that's how you create a good product as well is that, um, uh, I was having this discussion with someone the other day and like, yeah, I, know, I try not to have an ego with any of my ideas either. Like I just try to kind of like the point before Darren, like 
for lack of a better term, with like if you really push in the edge on something like the gearbox idea or whatever, kind of like mistake your way to success. Like, fuck, I've posted so many videos of predecessing um, uh, ideas about that gearbox that were never going to work, but it was like, fuck, like I'm on this roll, like I'll just post about it. I've got no ego to say like I have the answer, like it's a mm. – it's a path to try to find the right answer. Whereas I feel as though, uh, I feel as though a lot of bike companies almost have too much of an ego to step out of the boundaries and try something new. They're like, no, nah, we have the answer. This is what it is. But in two years time, it's like, no, nah, that geo was shit. This is now what it is. And like force it down your throat type thing. But yeah, I don't know. But Maybe that was like, like, a bit of a tangent. But. No, like big bike, like not to hate big bike companies, but like obviously there's a commercial agenda, right? And and it's and in a lot of ways, like it can be planned obsolescence. And mm. and that sucks. And, you know, that's how it works. And I, I, I can't remember what I was listening to. Oh, the Frameworks video with Nico and Ben Arnott's on it. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. I think a lot of people, people could be on better bikes if that was the goal. And he's like, but also they probably, he's something like, I'm paraphrasing, so I'm not quoting, but it's like, you know, they probably wouldn't look as good as well. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And that, and that, that is a really big thing. And, and that's something about like, I totally, I totally get that with bike brands and they're totally allowed to do that. Um, the thing that I do really like with your stuff, Nico, is because you share the process, people kind of see the evolution and see how that evolves. But I think a lot of the bike companies like, just bust this whole new tech out of nowhere and like we've reinvented the wheel and you know, it's like, what the fuck? like yeah it's something you know that I mean? that it's something over the, like over the last little bit that I've learned as well is that um, yeah people seem to really enjoy the process which yeah. like I enjoy the process and I really enjoy sharing the process with people I've been a little bit surprised about how much people actually do enjoy the process because like it still dumbfounds me that people are actually interested in seeing behind the scenes stuff and without mm. sort of trying to plug my own thing, I've like kind of taken an avenue lately to provide people with like even more behind the scenes stuff, which is kind of cool. It's like been pretty receptive, which is, which is good. But um, I was like real close knit, like kept a lot of stuff really close to my heart for a while. Um. But then the more people were appreciative of it, the more, I guess it, it's more of a reflection of myself. Like, I guess I was a little bit shy of putting stuff out there because I was like, ah, oh, what are people going to think of this type of thing? But the more sort of confidence that I got with the grand growing, with the brand growing and all that type of stuff, my, like a lot of my perception on it has kind of changed. Like, of course, you've got to be relatively conscientious with um, like, uh, like if you want to protect the IP and that and you've mm. kind of got that in, like you don't want to give away anything and, and shoot yourself in the foot. But where I can, I like just posting stuff, even if it's not ready, like just letting people know what I'm up to. And, and like that kind of fuels me too. It's kind of weird. Like, but yeah, I don't know. It's like at a race when you or wherever, like when you're in a jam with all your buddies, I know for me anyway, I always ride better when I'm in that type of scenario because you're all just kind of pushing each other. Mm. And it's kind of the same. Like if I just post a video of the gearbox or whatever and I see people interacting and commenting on it and sharing it and stuff like that, I don't know what it is, but it sort of spurs on more creativity. So I, I kind of like that side of it. It's like positive reinforcement, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's good. I, I think, like, you're super smart for doing it, dude. And I know it's probably not the plan at all, but, it's like, that creates a lot of brand identity and people people feel like they're part of that project then, you know what I mean? Like, mm. um, I think it's, it's different to what anyone else is doing, you know what I mean? And people become invested in your brand for what it is. And at the end of the day, if your goal is to have people have more fun on their bikes, which is what it seems it is, then you're doing yeah. it for the right reasons and it's good, you know what I mean? So, yeah. keep it coming. Like, I like... Someone said something the other day, like I put up this stupid fucking Insta clip and they're like, I love that you put your crashes in. And I was like, well, I'm not just going to put all the good things in. Like the crash is the funniest part. Like, yeah. You know it's I mean? it's <laughs> passionate thing. Like you're not trying to be someone you're not. Like, nah. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. no, nah, I, I love it. Keep the gearbox videos coming. Thanks, man. Yeah. That means a lot. Um, keep the segue going. 
kind of because I wanted to talk about the World Cup race just gone because I wanted right. your input on it. Right. But your part's doing cool shit. Um, not sure if I'm allowed to talk about this, but someone was running a modified Norco range at the. Andorra oh, you can World talk Cup. about whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was sick. Yeah, yeah I, um, thanks, thanks for sending the link to Lockheed. Like I, um, uh, it, some people might think like, cause like I post fairly regularly on the WRP page and whatever, but, um, I try not to succumb too much to the influence of, like, try not to stare at my phone all day. So I actually missed that article and a, a couple of days had gone by and it was actually you Lockheed that sent it over and I was like, Oh fuck, that's cool. Like glad I got it sent over to me. I I'm sure I would have seen it at some stage, but um, yeah, I mean, Ellie, I really like, I like Ellie and Duke. Um, They're just a really good young couple that do, I mean, they're great riders, but they do good things for the Aussie mountain bike scene, I think. So Mm. like, um, yeah, I I like them both. They're really cool people, but yeah, I, I help Ellie out with a couple of parts and she's got the, her Norco range modified with, um, with a mullet yoke in it, but she's also running a two two five uh, Ida Eye shock, so it's like in DH mode. So she's got over two hundred mil of rear travel. Um, so yeah, she qualified for Andorra World Cup, which um, whether she's on my parts or not, I'm bloody stoked because that's awesome work. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, it's good stuff. But how, how, sick. how good is it watching? At the moment, I'm happy to eat my words to say fuck the national series because we don't need it clearly. Because um, <laughs> we've got what, like 20 riders racing in Jora or trying to get yeah, into Yeah, and Andorra. imagine how good that'd be if we had a national series. Truth. Yes. Yeah. No, no I, but yeah, I, you, like, yeah, the Aussies are going good. It's um, sick to see so many people back overseas and like, I don't know, just that kind of hunger to go do that is back. Like, I feel it was kind of, even before COVID, it was like diminishing a bit. You know what I mean? Like the privateer thing was mm. kind of a bit less and less. Obviously, it was only top 60. Like there's a lot of things pushing people back from trying to do that. And people were yeah. focusing on like crankworks and stuff. And like crankworks was cool, but the rest of the crankworks series is lame. Like, and now it's like back to World Cups. And yeah, I think it's sick. But yeah, back to that point too, Mick. Like, I think there needs to be, like, there needs to be more state rounds, there needs more national rounds, and we like build people up as opposed to just like dropping people overseas because people are going overseas there now. And I think some of them, it's like single swim, right? Like, it, yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, it's a, it's a double edged sword. Like, what it does do with, um, having such sort of shit support for the mountain bike scene mm. um, is it does, as bad as it sounds, it does breed a lot of hunger for Aussies, I think, to get over there and just say, well, fuck racing in Australia. I'm just going to go overseas and give it a good crack. I um, did the same. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. more expensive for me to do national series than it was to go overseas sometimes. Like, Yeah, no joke. Um, so there's that. Um, what it is going to do i think which is unfortunate is like with no no national series and stuff like that i think that more people will do like what the zwas have done and just move over there um so i think they're really like um you know like old cycling is really running the risk to risk of not only do they not have a national series but the chance of getting a national series is going to diminish because a lot of the professionals or the guys at that level, guys and girls at that level will just move overseas anyway. Um, so that's kind of crap. But in, in any case, yeah, I'm just stoked to see the Aussies doing really well because there's a lot over there um, and there's a lot of them doing really, really good. Um, but to your point about Crankworks and and all of that, Lockie, I think you're 100% right. Like nothing – like – there's heaps of mountain bike festivals that are so sick, but there's something about World Cups that are just mm. – there's nothing that can replicate them. World um, Cup's a pinnacle, right? Like, it's F, it's F1. Like, it, it's – and it's getting more and more like that, right? Like, everyone – no one's on stock stuff. Like, no. Nelly's not on stock stuff. You know what I mean? Like, it's nuts. Like, and this is very – yeah, don't mean to get down. This is where I wish the whole green to gold thing I had worked because the whole goal with that was to have an Aussie tent. 
you know, and have it sponsored by a tool company and stuff and just Aussies can come back and chill and just have a space over there. But I, think, um, um, I, I don't know if we should mention it on the podcast, but um, fuck Lockie, I reckon we need to get something going. Yeah, I'm funky, man. I'll, yeah. I'll, foot the bill for, I'll foot the bill for something like that. Like, not, like I mean, I'll chip in as yeah. much as what needs to go in to make something like that happen. Because, like, at the, at the moment, like, I, I just feel sorry, having been one of these people too, like, I just feel sorry for all the Aussie contingent that's over there because they're doing it all by themselves. Like, even if they've got um, sponsorship or whatever, but from their own Australian Federation, like, they don't give a fuck. So, no, you know, yeah, I don't know. Let's make our yeah. own Federation. Let's do it. <laughs> That's very yeah, sidetracking. Yeah. yeah. However it needs to happen, I think it needs to happen. Like, you know, I've kind of um, got my own thing going, like privateer parts program and something like that. But, like, I, yeah, I'd really like to – yeah, we should keep the conversation going because mm. I reckon we could make something happen if a bunch of us got together and like fuck this, actually do it properly for the good of the Australian mountain biking community. I think it needs to happen. And then on top of that, without sort of going off on another tangent, did you hear that Bright might be getting shut down? Yeah, I saw that on. I saw Dino yeah. shared on Facebook. Actually, I didn't even check Facebook and it came up. And I didn't read the thing fully. I just saw what Dino said. But yeah, what yeah. the fuck. I think it's come to shock for everyone. Like, what the fuck? It's forestry, right? Like, they're cutting it down. Yeah, HVP, yeah. Which, like, Rotorua is like that, right? And But I think the agreement with Rotorua is they have to put, and I don't get it, I probably get this real wrong if any of my friends in Rotorua are listening, but, like, they have to put trails back in after they log it. Mm. You know what I mean? Which is sick because then you get new trails, right? But, um, <laughs> yeah, so weird, man. Like, Bryce is been built up for so long and then to see it go is just real <laughs> weird but it was getting funny too right like we went to go do that a launch when the jekylls came out there and i think it mm. was like maybe it was like 160 bucks a day to shuttle or something like private shuttles so to pay ridiculous. for the roads and i was like what the fuck so maybe that yeah i know it's weird dude yeah because uh, i mean i'm not gonna i did read um a fair bit of the article but it's been a long day, so I'm, my comprehension's probably not the best. But um, some of the stuff that they're talking about implementing, I'm like, well, that's already implemented, like, you know, like a, a pay-to-use type service, which you already do. Like, you already pay to act mm. for access to the hill, whether mm. it's on, whether it's by shuttles like Blue Dirt or whether it's privately. Um, but, yeah, look, I don't know. It's... it's um, it's not good. Like I commented on Flo's thing and this is like a broader kind of comment, but um, my comment was something like, uh, like Bright Beauty Falls Hotham should be the, like the Morzine of Australia. And it should 100%. be. Like, yeah. Dude, I, Fall, I don't know how Falls those four is like, know. yeah. Falls is my, I reckon Falls has the most potential. Like, out of mm. all of them, like in terms of dirt, there's a massive because they've got that Michaelis race, right? And you can ride yep. a 45 minute downhill lap. You know what I mean? And yep. there's a couple of little pinchy bits and whatnot. But like I reckon Falls is is the one. Like, um, or, uh, is it Beauty Bullet? Sorry, Bullet won't ever be because Bullet just sucks and the locals suck. Um, but yeah, I reckon Falls is the one. I reckon it's a better shuttle road. It's got way gnarlier shit and like yeah they need to band together and be like hey i was talking to one of the guys at the at a hotel we had dinner out of ignition last year and he's like yeah there's all these more tracks coming in i was like this should be the place like this should be yeah. the place and you should have people staying here all summer well and i think dino's really behind the falls plan oh, really? at the, um yeah, okay. which is which is really good um but i think like on a broader scale like, you know, we can point the finger at whoever, like HVP or who's the plantation owner, by the way, or, you know, whatever. But at, at the end of the day, what it really comes down to, in my opinion, is piss weak state government. I mean, yeah. Victoria's got some of the, Victoria's got some of the best landscape, well, in the country, but like realistically in the world for building mountain bike trails mm. and the governance is, fucking piss poor 
it's just bullshit. Like yeah. what's happening with the Warburton project is just shameful. Yeah. Um, and dare I say, it's just um, that's just sort of similar across the board across the board yeah. in Victoria. It's you've yeah, just got to get the, see, the ski resorts on board. This is the thing where like none of those mm. bike parks overseas. They're, they're yeah. all they're all ski resorts, right? And they've all seen what Vale's done, and they're like, "Sweet, this is this is there's actually a way to make money out of this." You know what I mean? It's not just a bunch of smelly mountain bikers. Whereas at the moment, it's all trying to go through government, and they don't really get it. And then they never put like it's like with Warburton, right? Like Warburton is such a head fuck, and it's because no one they should have sent a change manager through there to start with it, and a project manager. Like, cool, this is the ultimate goal and this is how we need to start talking to locals over the next three years and just ease it in. That didn't happen. A whole bunch of people moving out there like, fuck yeah, mountain bikes. The locals hate it because they don't want any change. And it just was really poorly done. But if you do it with a company who wants to make money from it, it'll happen. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so let's just stop relying on government. Let's just, you know, get the get the steers off behind. Like, Threadbow's, Threadbow's key, right? Like, Threadbow does it well. You know, Threadbow's lessening some events now because they, um, they've got so many lift tickets in the day, they don't want to cut that down. Like, yeah, you know, and falls and those resorts would get behind it. For sure. And that's where, to go back to your point, I, I really hope that, um, that the plans that I've heard discussed with falls and whatever, I really hope that comes to fruition because I think that that could be really, really good. Yeah. yeah Let's have seen, a place where people can train and get world cups. Seen similar shit here. Like they just rely on the government for grants and all that shit, and everything gets promised and it gets pulled away. And like, why don't you just do it privately and like yeah. try and make a business out of this thing? And definitely, just, like yes. it's from from having sort of, I don't know, like a, I'm by no means like an Adelaide local, but I've spent sort of enough time there, I guess, to um, like Adelaide's got such better support than even Vico mm. though. Mm. Trail building. Vico is just a shit show at the moment. We have a whole, all these ski fields and no no one runs a chairlift down here. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? For mountain yeah. biking. Like you go to you go to Buller and you get the shuttle bus up because they don't want to use the the last couple of years of line left on the lift. Like it's so weird. Same with falls like and like Blue Dirt do the best job in the world, right? But there's a lift there. Like yeah. <laughs> Why aren't we on that lift? Like, yeah. So, yeah. So, I someone, I think there starts to be some more commercial stuff involved with it, or, you know, may, and maybe it's a thing of, you know, fucking sounds bad, but global warming happens and the ski seasons get worse or something. And they're like, oh, actually, we can just do what these other places do overseas season make more money. I don't know. Mm. Just need millionaires to start riding more and invest more money. Yeah. Speaking of downhill tracks and stuff, what do you think of the World Cup trap? Because that looked fucking scary. Looks sick. Andorra is yeah. the scariest place I've ever ridden. And there's never, that's the only track, the old track, not the old, old track, but the middle old track. Um, there was literally a point in that track where, from the steepness, I was like, I'm getting off my bike and I'm walking this and I'm never going back up that hill ever again. <laughs> so, like, and that is like the kind of the other side of it. But, like, yeah, that place is so gnarly, man. And that gap, like, that's, I wouldn't even call it a step down. Like, yeah. Off, like, <laughs> oh my god! And like, it's crazy the level of risk in the sport now, where that like would make or break. Like, for sure. Like, Eddie. Oh my god! I was holding my breath when Eddie came through. Mm. Um, and then I think uh, who was? I think it might have even been Bernard Kerr who mm-hmm. um, collapsed his wheel on that in practice. Yeah. Um, and at least someone else did as well, but just rode their hub out of it somehow. Yeah. And then Fuck Phil that. Atwell got caught out on it. Mm-hmm. Phil Atwell's getting caught out. Like, that's something to say because he's probably one of the most talented, like, as far as skill is concerned, guys on the hill. <laughs> um, yeah, that was gnarly. I had a couple of people say to me who, like, I guess, aren't that weathered to mountain biking, being like, oh, it doesn't even look that big. And I'm like, motherfucker, <laughs> if those guys are fucking up, <laughs> it's big. Did well, you like, see, yeah. um, yeah. yeah. see Manal's crash? 
Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, I, Lucky, I thought sorry. that was the coolest. No, I thought it was one of the coolest tracks that I've had recently. Like it had everything. It was like moto up the top, but you could also get a sprint in. Cause I love, I love a track where you can still pedal. Like if you can't mm-hmm. pedal on track, I think it's a bit stupid. So it wasn't a lot of the top, right? But you still could, you still could power through it. Big old moto jumps and then like beautiful scenery, good steep shoots. The only thing that um, some of the bridges and the rubber just have from having ridden bridges there with the rubber, it is scary. Um, I wish they'd get rid of that. And then the finish, like that was terrible. Yeah, what the fuck was going on with the finish? Poor, yeah, like. Luke, poor dude. No, Remy. Oh, man. Remy, Remy, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know but how it's not just like yeah. dead. Six. Yeah. But the thing I love the most about Andorra is it was a new track and you see, you know, all these new people come up. Mm. And and that was the thing I found going overseas. Like, I remember the first year riding Fort Bill. Like, and there's, don't get me wrong, like, I'm not saying I was quick and it was like I was, you know, in a bad position from not riding it. But, like, there is a lot you get from riding those places multiple times. And there's definitely people who will go higher up the result sheets because they've ridden there before. Um, and then to have a brand new jacket at Dora and then, you you know, you see Luke and, and those guys just absolutely nail it. And you're like, sick. Like, these guys are really skilled. Like, if I was a team manager, I'd be looking at the results from the new tracks more than the existing ones, you know what I mean? To oh, see potential. Uh, it, was, it was sick. Like, yeah, I just thought that track looked amazing i would shit myself riding it but it looked amazing to watch yeah i yeah. think if uh yeah. rob because i know rob will on the listens to this but if he calls luke an underdog again i'm gonna fly over there <laughs> and slap him <laughs> like <laughs> seriously man i hope i hope if those boys change teams like they end up together um mm. is there a rumor? i don't know is if there a rumor, happen, but i've heard some rumors but nothing crazy but i hope they I hope whoever signs them kicks them together. I think that's that would be a cool thing to have in a team. I think is to have brothers for each other. And those those two are so nice, man. Like I, mm-hmm. I've met them twice now. I worked in their forks and shops and just really lovely kids. Like yeah. yeah, they are. They're really they're really good. I I never knew them very well from like their BMX days, but I think Luke I think he's a couple of years younger than my brother. But I like I remember Luke racing BMX when he was a kid and they've always been quick. Yeah. Um, which is, I don't know, it's just cool to see. Like, yeah. I, really I need like to look at their results, but their season this year has been crazy, right? Like they were winning on, EWS, or they were winning EWSs and on podiums. And now they're on that, yeah. there is a crazy stat about Luke. He's only lost one stage in the EWS. He hasn't, Holy shit. He's almost clean swept every race. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Those kids are on it. Yeah. yeah for sure. Um, but still, like to see Zwar up there. To yeah, see, that was sick too. Yeah, yeah, like to see. That's a long time these. coming, dude. He was on the hot seat for a long time. I um, uh, yeah, he was on the hot seat for a long time. I was like, this is looking pretty good. I wonder what he felt like. It's probably the longest time he's been up there, right? I don't know. I'd, I'd say probably, yeah. Yep. Uh, Luke, um, Luke like, buys his roots and range. Crazy, eh? He's having a look, sorry. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Even what those boys have done, I reckon it's really cool. Like, um, kind of the fuck you do it. I was cycling and just pack up and go. <laughs> I, just <laughs> they, I just love they, I just love they did something. Like, same thing as what you're saying in making parts, right? Like, they were just like, you know what? This ain't working. We're just gonna yeah. go sort our own shit out. I was like, fucking kudos to kudos yeah. to them. Like, I mean, it's it would have been ju- like would have been just as easy to sit here and piss and moan and be like, yeah. oh fuck Australia cycling and and never like you know never take a big step. Whereas they packed up their shit, went yeah. over there, and I think there's gonna be probably like like the union team is obviously doing really good stuff as it is, but I think that. They're probably going to end up on an even bigger team next year. Mm. Mm. Well, I think fastest, fastest Santa Cruz of the day as well. They're so, yeah, that's why they I, say, I think they're going to be on a bigger team next year. <laughs> I don't that, think they will. That testing stuff they did at the start of the year, it was like with Olin's, and, they, and mm. they're like, we've never tested before. And I was like, holy fuck. I was like, you guys are yeah, not going to know yourself. It's not even just like the testing the stuff doesn't make you any quicker, but it's just that confidence. You're like, this is the quicker setup. Like, it's good. Yeah, but yeah, fucking hats off to them. Like, just, yeah. 
if you don't like Oz Cycling, don't end up being one of those dudes having a bitch at the pub. <laughs> hey, yeah, otherwise, <laughs> yeah, otherwise you'll just be that 40-year-old dude that would be like, I could have made it, but fucking Oz Cycling. It's like, well, go fix it. Like, fuck yeah. it. Mm. On uh, Remy Ma Smith, his splits were second, 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 third until he crashed. Yeah, dude, that was, yeah. Heartbreaking, like, yeah. And that, I hate those crashes when they people just, I don't like crashes. Like, and people send me crash stuff all the time. Yeah, like, I don't like watching My, like, non-cycling mates. I'm like, Sorry. check this out. <laughs> and then, like, that one, I didn't wasn't expecting it. I, someone said it because I fell asleep from the, from the, um, when it was on. I didn't see it. And then uh, I thought it was him winning. And then I was like, mm. oh, yeah, no. Nah. Yeah, no, that was a disgusting crash. Yeah. Speaking but from a shit finish, like that finish is yeah. just stupid. Like, like you should not have a techie, like, like finishes should just be wide open, right? Like no one is getting to the finish being like, I just need to chill out a little bit here. Like the adrenaline's full gas, the caffeine's kicked in that I had an hour before, like, they're good to go, like mm. you know what I mean. I'm surprised more people didn't eat absolute shit on that thing. Yeah. Speaking as well, I just want to mention this, but people saying "fuck you" to us cycling and doing their own team thing. Uh, at least MP with like collab racing. So those guys yeah. basically got two families together, made their own UCI yeah. team. Yeah. Uh, she got 11th in juniors and just got selected for world's team. So yeah, good work. I My money's on at least to go well, like. Bella and Willa. She's, yeah. again, lovely family. She's lovely. Bit quiet, but lovely, but she's goddamn quick. Like. One of those people that's dead silent off a bike and you put them on yeah. a bike and everything just, yeah, just comes yeah. out. It's insane. But she's young, right? Like, I was pretty mm-hmm. quiet when I was young. You know what I mean? Too? <laughs> like, I wasn't. <laughs> but, yeah, I think, um, yeah, there's, like, watch this space for her. Like, it's 100%. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's pretty sick. There wasn't much tech that I can think of out of that other than Connor. No, that's what I love with new track. There's way less tinkering and like new shit, you know what I mean? Because everyone's all on the track, so it's not like here's a new shock. Right? Like- other than Connor's forbidden Megalodon, I think they're calling it that new downhill bike they've got, mm. but that was last race. I'm not going to yeah. speak to Connor here because I just haven't spoken to Connor at all and I don't speak to Connor, but um. I don't think he looks as comfortable on that bike. I was chatting to one of the guys rowing the week about this than he did on his last bike. And then speaking of underdogs, there's a lot of psychology to the whole being an underdog thing. But I wonder if like, and maybe it's the same with like the Buttercups thing. Like, was he more rattled on the last bike and felt like he's going quicker and was pushing the bike? Because I just feel like he doesn't look quite right on that bike. I don't know why. Maybe it's just bike time. Maybe it's because the other bike he got to ride all the time in different mm. variations, but I feel he doesn't look as comfortable on that thing or, or it doesn't, I don't know, the, the rear end looks not quite right, the front looks a bit too high. Like, Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I actually had that conversation with someone. That yeah, okay. com- yeah. I was like, he doesn't look as confident, but then I think he is quoted for saying somewhere that he's still trying to find the limit. Like yeah. He yeah. can't find the limit of that bike yet. So, yeah. But I agree. He looked way better on the, the Dreadnought. Mm. What do you think about that bike, Mick? Uh, yeah, like I like the look of the bike. I reckon the bike looks sick. Like it's a virtual high pivot, so I reckon that's cool. Like it's like the Norco range and like our Trinity, um, which from a kinematic standpoint, I mean, we've been banging on it about it for a while with the Trinity thing, but like I think it's coming to show that there's some real clout behind the virtual high pivot platform. Um, I mean, it's so hard to speculate on on individual sort of circumstance. Like, for one, that level is so fucking high. All those guys are going so fast. Um, the tracks are so demanding. And so, it, like, it's so hard to speculate. Like, um, yeah, like, he, like, Connor definitely looked really, really comfortable on the Dreadnought or the Shreadnought, whatever. Um, like it's set up as a downhill bike and it's set up as an enduro. I think there's always a lot to be said for being comfortable on the bike, like having mm. bike time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think he like by any means look, looked uncomfortable on the downhill bike, 
Um, I mean, that track was obviously very demanding. The level's super high. So, I like, I feel as though, like, just a couple of races is hard to make a judgment of the bike. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, like, Connor looks comfortable on anything. Um, yeah, he's, like, certainly one of my favourite dudes to watch ride a bike. Um, and then when you overlap, like what I was saying, like, you know, the level's super high, all that, like, any bike just takes a lot of time, I guess, to set up. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, just bolting on suspension and onto a new frame and launching into a World Cup is, yeah, that'd be pretty tricky, I reckon. Oh, I don't know the situation, but I think it's crazy to have someone on a different bike me right through the season. And, like, and I don't know the situation, don't know anything, I haven't spoken to anyone about it, but I would assume it's not like he'd be riding that in the background leading up to it and he's just a bit more comfortable than the other bike. It seems like that bike just came out and there's a new bike. Like, I think yeah. he had three days on it before the first <laughs> time he raced it. That is crazy, man. Like, in my head and, and, and you know, the people I am mates with, like Aaron, like, you wouldn't do that to, to a top guy. In saying that, it could just be a development year for them and the team and the bike and everything. This could be like a throw. I know they wouldn't want to do it, but like a throwaway. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, for me, and like, and I'm nowhere near race ahead than these guys, but I couldn't deal with that. No. Like, if you're going to a World Cup, you're going there to, to win. In my True. head, you know what I mean. Like, unless you are someone who's out the back of the race, not trying to win, just trying to test up in that situation. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. There's something, there's the biggest thing to be said, exactly as you said, Mick, and, and Aaron was saying this on a downtime of the other day, is, is just being comfortable on a bike. Like, mm-hmm. just that time, you know what I mean? That, and that is key. Like, you know exactly what that thing's going to do in all situations. It's so key. Yeah, I also think, like, I'm not going to try to sound like a psychologist here or anything like that because I'm not. But like, I I like this is from my own personal right, and don't get me wrong, like, you know, never even been close to qualifying for World Cup. But like, at the same time, I think that the reason why why being comfortable on the bike is important, and like for me anyway, like, and I'm kind of like this with any part that I make for myself or like the Trinity or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I like getting comfortable with things in my own time, like going for rides mm. by myself and like working it out. Um, and just, I don't know, like in the off season type of setting. And I feel as though like when that bike becomes second nature to you and then you put in a, like second nature to you in a, your own sort of private setting on your local trails and whatever. And then when you get launched into a World Cup where the stress is super high and when you're riding, everything's happening just kind of on second nature, like you don't want to be thinking about it in the forefront of your mind, like mm. it's, it's kind of got to happen. I think that's why if you've spent a lot of time on a bike, no matter what bike it is, is it's comfortable to you because you're making those subconscious decisions in the race environment on a, you know, super stressful um, sort of mm. environments and all that type of stuff. And I think that's why being spending a lot of time on, on the off season is like really important. I think it's key. And, and just being like testing in general. Like testing is comfort. And I think the, honestly, I think the majority of testing is more to do with eliminating possibilities and it is to finding the ultimate setup like you can chuck in like in this like we we're ever bang on that shock tunes right all shock tune tunes are changing is is a certain speed that the oil can move out you're not going to win a race because your shock tune is different shock is tuned differently mm. like it's not a night and day difference it's a little thing but it's the same mm. thing on our bike it's like have you tried all of those and maybe Connor's is super chill and like whatever, but like to eliminate it in my head or, or, or like those, you know, the top, top guys, like 
I feel like they'd want to have that stuff eliminated out of their head, not to be like, oh, if I had this or if I change this or any of that kind of stuff. And maybe Connor's just a dude where he's like, I don't care. I'll just shred the thing and see you later. But yeah. um, yeah, like that testing component, I think is so key just to, just to yeah, eliminate things and to know, to be confident and comfortable with the fact that your setup is the best setup for you. Mm. Yep. Which is why Troy is so consistent. And why it works. So, yeah. They just know what works. They what know, right? Like Loic like, does yeah. the telemetry and they measure it and there's a number. And and it seems that Troy's going more a feel and, and but they do a lot of testing in the background. Mm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Should we answer some uh listener questions and then fuck off out of here? Yeah, mate, I'll stay, for as long as, I'll stay for as long as you want. I don't mind. That so makes bad time. Yeah. Moment, so I like having a chat. <laughs> it's, yeah, we've still got an hour until mixed bad time, I think. I think it's nine o'clock. So, oh, it's only half an hour because it's your time. Yeah, no, I've been, I've been bad at getting to bed early lately. I've had this creative burst at like about this time and my, um, my prefrontal cortex is going, go to bed, fucking go to bed. But my creative part's been like, no, nah, you're on a roll. Keep going. So, I thought you said you weren't a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, most certainly not. No. Nah. Um, this is an interesting one that I wanted to know about because I kind of think I know why, but I'm not 100% sure. And I'm interested to, to know your feelings, but why are Torx bolts a thing that was sent in by Rory Gibbo? Well, the, the contact area is greater and you've got more teeth. Um, I believe that a lot of them came out originally for more of like a, not like a tamper proof, but like less people had talks to undo shit, but now they've become quite common. Um, I could be off the mark there. I don't know what you think, Lockie, but I, I think greater, more teeth and like greater purchase area is better. And I guess that, because like the teeth are, are concave, like they, they follow a ra- follow a radius, is like as you apply like um, like radial torque to it, is those teeth they're just not like a at a tangent edge like an Allen key, mm-hmm. so you know, they're not going to strip out as easy. Only thing I'd once heard, and it wasn't why, but there are some saying they they're meant to be more accurate for torque wrenches as well. There's less movement in the in the bit in the. That would make sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I like it's funny. Like people get really opinionated on <laughs> on talk skis, and at the end of the day, I really couldn't care. Less. But I don't mind. I don't mind talk skis. To be honest, it's just as long as the the bolt's actually big enough. I feel like a lot of them are synonymous with um, having a smaller head. On them, and that's probably why they use a torque because if it like the, the actual head smaller than the, the groove smaller, um, if it was a normal Allen key, probably round out quicker, but then people just seem to round them out anyway. So, yeah, I reckon three mil shallow head bolts can eat a bag and they can all be replaced by T10s because they all just die. Like anything three yeah. mil should be T10. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, like, I like torques. I would I guess talk to everything. Fancy talk bit today. I'm impartial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't really care. Yeah, it's kind of weird. People get really. I watched some PB Swiss bits the other day. <laughs> very excited about those. They're very fancy. So someone got a pay rise. Some um, new talks. Yeah, I look- tell you what is 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 a handy kit to have. I've got some behind me. Is um like uh, talks sockets like female mm-hmm. talks because. Um, I'm not saying in the, in the bike sense because I don't think I've ever come across them in the bike industry, but like a lot of European cars and stuff have mm. like torque studs. Really? Yeah. I've yeah. never seen that in one of cars. So yeah. Yeah. And um, the point is if you don't have it, you're really fucked because there's nothing else. Like you you really need the torque socket. It, you can't really just jimmy your way around it. But What about Nitex pliers? Would they? <laughs> <laughs> you can fix anything with those things, man. Dude, I've I've taken out stripped out T twenty five rotor bolts real easy with those things. Mm. Yeah, I I I don't know what you refer to. I thought they were called Jesus pliers. Yeah, the Jesus pliers. Yeah. 
I realized I've got four of them. The other day. I used to set to uh, get a Shimano lead port thing out the other day because someone ripped it. They're so good. They just fix everything. Oh, amazing. Um, all right. Let's move on to another question, which I thought I had prepared. Ah, this was an interesting one as well because it's a SRAM thing that I got asked the other day as well. What is the best way to get a sticky piston that's inside a brake caliper working freely again? Spit on oh, it. It's super- <laughs> <laughs> this one's fucking easy. I lost, lost, I lost <laughs> my little tool for it, which I'll try and find. So, Did, did you see Ben Arnott has a custom 3D yeah. printed tool? It's fucking sick. I was. I was looking at that and be like, yeah, and that was made for TRP. Yeah, but um, it's really simple, right? So um, I had a double rotor tool, but I literally have lost it since trying to build that new box up. So um, you can get two rotors, put it in the gap, pull the brake, all the pistons will come out, clean it, push them back. Um, the cleaning is the biggest part um, on there. Your front pistons are always going to move you more than your back pistons. And the side where the fluid comes in would probably always move a more than the side that doesn't. But the shindu one that just isn't moving. Um, but, yeah, what you're referring to is a piston massage, which sounds very fancy, um, which, yeah, you just literally let all the pistons come all the way in, clean them, only clean them with isopropyl. Um, never, ever, ever spray anything except isopropyl in there. You can use fucking like WD-40 or Teflon sprays and all this kind of stuff. And it will get the piston moving for a very, very short amount of time. And then especially on SRAM, it'll swell the, the, the seal in there. Um, and that's a reaction with the dot fluid. And then none of your pistons will move. So don't do that. Just clean with ice purple. Um, I floss just with a bit of blue towel, like a clean. Don't use a dirty rag. Go do that. Q-tips are really good as well, like cotton buds, mm-hmm. if there is quite a bit of grit around like the kind of the, the bit where the seal is. You don't want to push dirt back in. Um, and then I just use a eight mil, I got an eight mil park tool spanner that I use to push them back in because it kind of chamfers in. So it'll slide in, I'll wiggle them back gently and then use the circle end to get right in the middle of the piston and then just push it in. If it's, if you're fighting to push the piston in, you need to get the, the end of the spanner into a better place because it should just flow back into place really easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and then actually, do I have one here? When you're advancing your pistons, and this is a very underutilized tool that comes with your new brakes um these the pad spaces mm-hmm. that come with your with your disc brakes so i don't know if anyone can see this you probably all can't because you probably don't listen to it well. but um, <laughs> so these sides <laughs> here red, red. they're all yeah. dependent on which brake you're running so this one's actually off a road brake this is the exact width pretty much the exact width of the channel that goes through the caliper and then on the inside is your rotor size that you use on road. So you actually use that to advance the pads to it and it should all line up nicely and off you go. People just mm-hmm. chuck these in the bin and then don't align it and they're aligning it to their their rotor on their bike, on their yeah, rotor on the bike, and there's usually a cable getting pulled somewhere or the other and then nothing's even. So you just keep advancing it to that and then it's in the middle and they should all work freely. So yeah, but just double rotor. Um, it is in the manual, I think, for guide RSCs as well. Or if you've got the old motion control spanners, the 24 mil flat spanners that Shram used to make, that fits in there perfectly um, as well. But double rotor will get you sort of. Yeah, that, that pad spacer trick is very unknown considering yeah, how much, how useful it is, especially well, like these, those black ones. Yeah, the yeah. black one. I had one here. So the black ones. So oh, so multi tool. Oh, maybe it's not this. Oh, it is this black one. This is the code one, right? Yeah, it's a multi tool. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> code one clips in. It's for the larger pads. This is large, so you got use yeah. a bigger disc. Um, this will push your pistons back pretty nicely. I think that might even go on the slot, but I haven't tried that myself. But it's also a bottle opener. And a little bit of sandpaper on one of the leading edges, and it becomes a box cutter as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, this would be good just shanking things with it. Just sharp, sharpens it up and doesn't scratch everything. Yeah, but there's heaps of these kits. Just make sure you get the right one. I've got a whole drawer of these. There's a lot. But just just keep the ones out of your brakes. And if um, you're buying a new bike, um, ask your shop when you buy it if, they, if you can keep it, please, because I'll probably chuck them in the bin, but they're handy. I just throw them around the shop, really. 
just ninja sauce everywhere. Good. Dude, I lose. I lose them all the time. Yeah, I usually just give them to people at events, and I actually end up with, like not having the ones. I mean, so. <laughs> um, I think we who answer the most uh, appropriate, like most important question. <laughs> uh, do you put the logo of your tire or the tire model over your valve? Oh, I've changed mine lately. Eh? Uh, shit. I go. So, I go model over the valve. Yeah, that's what I'm doing now. But I used yeah. to be brand over out. There's a problem I have with that, and Maxis only put the model on one side of their tire. I'm pretty sure. Which is good because it's all drive side. Yeah, but then what if you're looking at the non drive side? Why would you take a photo? Why would you take a photo of your bike if it's no, not the drive side? <laughs> I put it on the logo so that if I'm racing and need to use the CO2 thing, I know exactly where the valve is every time. Yeah, okay. That's good. Yeah, I never thought about that, eh? Same as the logo for the hub. Like, that's why I put yeah. it in that valve hole. Yeah. Well, that makes that's yeah, so that my, my, um, the only reason I started doing it was because really when I was kind of impartial and it was really just until we started taking pictures of the Trinity and stuff like that, is it? I always felt bit, I always felt like the valve should be at the bottom on photos. This is so pedantic, but I always oh, yeah. felt like it looked better with the valve at the bottom and the logo at the top. Ah, the valve at the top with the logo at the top. <laughs> that, sorry, with the with the model at the top. But then with Maxis, the tire brand's upside down when you take a photo. That's my pet peeve. Yeah, that yeah. I, I, to be honest, like it's like the same with bar taping, right? Like I'm never gonna get. Like at the end of the day, you can still ride your bike, and it's fine. But yeah, it's just yeah. interesting because I was always, I was always brand, and then I think I just, I think I liked it more aesthetically. And then someone was like, "Yeah, all the pressure info is on the model bit," and I was like, "Oh, well, that mm. makes way more sense having the valve near the, the pressure stuff." But then when I really think about it, like I know what pressures I'm running anyway. So yeah, see with commuters, especially like mums or commuters or dads or whoever doesn't know about bikes, it's always the pressure right next to the valve for me. Mm. Like, I don't care what it looks like. Yeah. It just, it's the same as your car, right? They should all yeah. be there. The one thing that cracks, you know, speaking of the like, alignment thing, and this is actually probably why I would prefer the model name there now I think about it, is because it, it is only on the drive side and they're never in the same place for the brand when they are on both sides. Yeah. So, I, I, it's 100% right there. That <laughs> is the top. Because that cracks yeah. me. Like I had a bunch of good years for work and they were all, I was like doing these like 10 o'clock at night and I did them all because they weren't all going on bikes, they weren't cassettes. So I did them all to um, to the non-drive side and then when I flipped them around, they were all wrong and I was so salty. Yeah, I've been there. Like I remember I was real tired and I kept taking the tire off and putting it back on to realise I was doing a different side each time. Yeah, That's right. Why it's oh. wrong every time, and I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, good question. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But if it's not aligned to anything, that does hurt my OCD. Just align it to center. something. <laughs> just a, yeah, just align <laughs> it to something. Like, just have a method to your madness. <laughs> uh, sick. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. I don't know if you had any other topics, but I've just got the group chat open and I was looking at the Fox Suze Shram over four bleed valves. <laughs> I did want to know your stuff about this. Yeah. Because you know stuff what about patents and I don't. Yeah. Patents are precarious. Um, I filed a couple now. They're, I don't know. Sometimes I feel as though there should be. Sometimes I feel as though you should patent everything and then other times you should patent nothing. Like it should be all or nothing. And then there's a grayer in the middle where it's like some people just run it. Oh, I don't know. Like I'm not a, I'm not a patent attorney. I've like the stuff I've patented, patented is for like, I guess, commercial reasons. So if someone like a SRAM or Shimano hit me up, like, you can sell IP, like intellectual property. Um, I don't know. Like I, I did have a look at the article on Pink Bike 
I can understand why Fox is suing SRAM because mm. it's literally a carbon copy. Um, I, if I were SRAM, I would have just done them a little bit different. <laughs> um, considering that Fox has patented that in the past. I think that's more the, the topic is that, um, is that, uh, a patent examiner or a prosecutor or whatever would take one look at that and be like, you knew that Fox had a patent on that, like obviously because you're in the same, um, you're in the same discipline, like all that type of stuff. It was on you to know that that was already sort of done. But then at the same, like at the same time, it kind of pisses me off because I'm like, I understand that you can patent that, blah, blah, blah. But on something as arbitrary as a bleed valve, which has been done in moto and everything, like fucking hell, right? So the only people that can do a bleed valve on a MTB fork is Fox, is it? So like, like, yeah, I, you can come at it from two different, two different points of view. Um, I don't know if that makes sense at all, but. I think a thing to remember with a lot of this too, right, is like this, the person who files the shit isn't like one of you or I who's a writer and they're just like, I'm going to go sue SRAM. Like they're patent attorneys and their job is literally to find infringements on this stuff to make money. And it's the same thing that happened with Specialized and that Roubaix shop years ago, right? Like they Mm. patented or trademarked Roubaix. And then they went to sue a shop that was called Roubaix Cycles or something like that. You know what I mean? And like, and that's a different situation. Obviously, Specialized came through and like, oh, look, we're really sorry. It's just fucking gun ho patent, uh, trademark attorney. But um, it's interesting, right? Because other forks have had this. And, mm. and I don't want to get involved. I don't work for SRAM. I do work for the distributor. Mm. Uh, I, I, I'm not, nothing against Fox. You know, so I'm really not trying to get involved in this at all. But um, it is interesting because I feel, yeah, it's mixed. So there's other applications where this is. I'm pretty sure other brands have had this before, but obviously not trademarked. And that's where, like, I did a, when I did my marketing course, like, there was a whole semester's worth of fucking patent and trademark stuff. And it's interesting. It's really, really interesting. Um, it is really interesting. Yeah. So if there's existing technology that, and it was in court, like, it'll go to court and not talk about it. Um, so go through it that yeah. way. I thought the patent for what I was seeing had a little bit as well to do with the channel. That's um, what I heard, yeah. And the back of the fork um, okay. with Fox because they've got, obviously, the, the channel goes all the way up and that's also what allows the fluid to move through. And then in wow. the article, they mention fluid quite a bit, um, whereas the Rock Shock one has nothing to do with fluid. Um, it's just to, to air, obviously deal with air and the lowers because um, lower legs can be really progressive if there's an air build up. Um, but yeah, it's interesting, but like they're always going at it, to be honest. And like if a lot of us don't see the patent legal stuff. Like there's a lot of it. Like there has been so much of it. And I won't go into it too long, but pretty much all drivetrains patented out the wazoo. And that's why you see Canopy when they went to go make a new wide range cassette, they had to go to 13 speed because everything in 12 speed was, was done. It's all patented. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories around how the whole wireless thing happened and, and wireless was a system that, uh, from what I've been told, and I, I haven't looked this up explicitly, um, you know, Mavic owned the, the rights to um, and passed that along to SRAM due to some issues with Shimano. So they had Zap, they had Zap back in the day. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, like so much of that stuff is, is tied up in patents. And I look, I totally get it. Like you got a new tech, you got to get it patented. And you want to make the most amount of money you can on it. But yeah, this one will be interesting. Like they were in the Pimpark article said it as well. It was like they've been in um, court heaps over chain rings because X Sync was, well, X Sync's always been owned by SRAM. And that's to me the best made chain ring or best mm-hmm. chain ring design there is. Um, but they infringed on that. And then I can't remember what, what they were infringing on. Was it the skewer system or something? And they ended up being like calling it grits. I get the article. Yeah, article. something like that. And yeah. The, yeah. The other thing you've got to look at, and like as much as I hate to talk about this, is like it's such a um such kind of like a political game because on the flip side, if Fox didn't pursue suing SRAM over this, is that 
Shram would just look at them like a bunch of cucks. Like it's yeah. kind of like they're in the corner. They have to pursue the pursue it. Otherwise, it would send a really strong message to Shram that they can just do whatever the fuck they want. Well, but, I don't um, think it's just to Shram. It's to everyone, right? Like it like, is. Yeah, yeah. At exactly. the end of the day, like suing them, suing them is not. As this is what I'm saying. Like there's lawyers involved with this. They're not either people who's emotionally attached to the, to the brand. No. It's just like it's really it's really black and white. In their eyes, they've infringed on it, and Tram is probably going to fight that they have yeah. it, and then and that's it at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Like, will it make forks and stuff more expensive? Probably not. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, it's interesting. It's and then mm. there's there's a lot of yeah funny patents shit I've heard lately as well with wireless actually. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like I think when you read that pink black article, as someone who's not being on the other, not that I've been on the other side of the completely but I understand a bit more of it. And you're like, oh, well, they're suing each other and all. And I don't think it's as big a deal as what, you know what I mean? Like a court's going to rule yay or nay, that's it. And they'll settle. Yeah. yeah, yeah and I, I think, like I was saying, I think it's just as much to send a message to the opposing brand to be like, mm. not come across as a pushover. You know, I, yeah. like, I don't know what will happen, but I think there's probably a good chance that it might even settle outside of court. Like, you know, it's just a... Yeah. Anyway, yeah. But also, too, like, I'm pretty damn sure that Shran, you know, has done their due diligence as well, right? Like, mm. just just yeah. because something, just because yeah. it, the, the patents are really specific in nature. It's not just a, a bleedy hole on the floor. Like, there's a lot to it. And, yeah, and look, the other thing is with a patent is that um, I haven't read any of the documents. I'm not going to try to be an, an expert on it, but um, just because something's listed in the patent drawing doesn't mean that that's what's claimed in Fox's patent. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you, I've done patents before and like you have to do a drawing and explain arbitrary things that aren't even part of your patent, but to explain yeah. to the examiner when they get your report, like get your, get your specification, because you're trying to teach them as though they know nothing about it. So, you know, I did like a patent on the centre hub and I've got like multiple claims about that. But like in my patent drawing, which would be look similar, not zoomed in a fork like that, but I've got pictures similar to that that's got a line to the to the bike and been like frame, handlebar, mm. like just yeah. to paint the image of what a bike is. So just because they've got a picture there pointing to a bleed valve doesn't mean that the bleed valve is part of the patented claims mm. because what the patent is is really the claims. Um, and I'd be really, really surprised, and I could be way off the mark here, but I could be, I'd be really surprised if Fox has got in a claim a bleed valve because to claim something and to actually get it across the line too – is you've got to show novelty and or inventive step. Mm. And bleed valve's been done for a long time. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Hot. Yeah. Then the thing is, is if, yeah, if Shram could prove that someone else had done it before, but it has to be, I'm pretty sure, in, in bicycle, then, then it would be null and void. Mm. But DVO, yeah, it, DVO, I've done it for years. Yeah, it, it'll be really interesting, man. You know, and then yeah. yeah, like I was, I just got the article up. I was just looking at the patent. There's a lot to it, but um, yeah. So they were saying that um, race face, which is Fox, I'm pretty sure, was doing yeah. chain rings, and then Tram uh, had axles all the other way around. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they end up being like, yeah, no worries. I think it's like a bit of a swap and royalties to the chain rings, which kind of makes sense because you make a lot more chain rings into axles. The thing that pisses me off is if it's bound to breach the patent, they're going to destroy all the forks that have it. That's just that's just what they had to claim. So, look, and again, so, not getting involved, but say that did happen, say it was proven, there'll be some form of a settlement. Like they're not. I highly doubt you're sending back your your Imagine that. Z, like, like, it's not that yeah. not this happen. and this this you know we'll probably be talking about the outcome of this in like four or five years, right? Like. Was it six years? I think it said there. Yeah. I was reading before. Like, yeah. yeah, this stuff doesn't like. It's not like you know. It's not a um. So if someone's killed someone, they're straight to court. Like, I wonder yeah. who's got the paint on on creaky CSUs though. That's what I want to know. 
<laughs> Dude, the comments are so funny, and I'm not I'm not getting into either brand here because I've got I've got friends of Vox and I love Tram. But um, the comments on that were so goddamn good, mm. like some of the best ones yet. And I wanted to post it up, but I just didn't want it to be negative towards the other brand. So, yeah, but there's some funny ones there. Not 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 funny in terms of like they're doing a bad job. Just the creativity mm. of pink white comments are amazing. So. It's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. But that's the other thing too, right? Like, like people get real, real gnarly about creepy CSUs. And like, don't get me wrong. I understand it's annoying, but like all of your forks have a warranty and it's a press fit. I know the system is not the best, but I can't think of any other better way to do it. Maybe Mick will one day, but like it's a press fit system and you're literally plowing into stuff the whole time. Like it will start to do that at some point. Like, you know what I think if any fork brands are listening here, fucking please do this. I know that your machining has got to be spot on because if it's not spot on, you're going to have a permanently like, yeah. I can't see why. I Just fucking like tape it spline. Just get it done. Mm. Like a crank. I've honestly, I have never had a crank CSU. Okay, right. You should ride my pikes. Fucking hell. Should ride I think I'm asking a bit much out of it. Sounds like I, I should just get you a CSU. It sounds like I should yeah. just get you a CSU. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're not that expensive. Yeah. Oh, it's day. Just change yeah, the no, CSU. I'm, we'll get a warranty. But again, I'm not complaining about it. I don't go on pink bike and be like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, yeah. Yeah. I won't lie. I don't know if it's my CSU or my left wrist. But, anyway. but like, that being said, too, right? Like, if you're having creepy CSU, you're out and speak for. For Fox, I speak for having worked with the service department. SRAM service department in Australia is amazing. If yeah. and you book it in for a service and like they'll be able to give you a price on it. And it's usually very reasonable. Like they're not there to yeah. sit you up. They're not there, mm-hmm. they're not set up to make money and they'll get you going. So I think exactly what you're saying, Mick, like if you've got those issues, just go talk to your bike shop and they'll probably be able to help you out. And then you won't creep. <laughs> or you can just complain about it on the internet. <laughs> don't get angry at your bike shop if it takes one of the companies in this battle a week to fix that problem. Yeah. Well, like one company that like I prefer will probably take a week if they're stock and then the other one could take three or four months. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had to say it. Oh, but yeah, man, like you, you, can, you can get that stuff fixed. And that's the thing. Like a CSU is, it sounds like a crazy part and, and they can be expensive, but they're not a bigger. They're not a big part at the end of the day. I, I kind of feel like I don't know if I just look at it differently. Mm. But yeah. Um. What? How many chains do you reckon that Nikolai Nucleon takes? The one with that Lemos bike Supre drive. Well, it's only one. Only one chain. Really? Yeah. Nah, that'd be more than one chain. I reckon. Oh, you mean like if you would have to join chains to make oh, a yeah, link? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was like, I thought you were saying, does it run multiple loops of chain? No, no, no. Um, it looks uh, like an uh, alternator belt for a car. Like I don't know. I, eh, you might. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really so the Norco far, ranges, I think, I think I was reading some of the day that they're, was it 128 links? Anyway, it's like six more links than like chains are. <laughs> Like, yeah, it's yeah. just like so annoying. And then like they're like, Norco can get them cut that length. And so if you're an OEM, like you cut your chain that you want. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's and I had a problem with um uh Jekyll I was working on. It was an extra large, and obviously they cut the same length chain for all the models and all the chain stays, chains shape. Um mm-hmm. but yeah, that I think that's gonna be the most annoying thing. Like I think bike brands need to make longer chains for all these high pivot bikes. So that's going to be a massive pain in the ass. Like, totally. Yeah, I totally agree. I've had that thought for a while. Like I've had high pivots for a while. Um, and yeah, like like on a Supreme, yeah, you literally cut like one link out. <laughs> <laughs> Just fits. And that's, you know, not a very extreme example. Yeah. There's yeah. not too many ones that are crazy, crazy long. Like, um, all the jackals I've worked on one chain. I think the forbiddens Timmy was saying was like just more than one chain. But yeah, just like maybe everyone needs to pay a couple more bucks and have a few extra links. But I think chains should get longer. Like road chains have gotten short, got shorter for a while, like really short. 
because of access and then they yeah. went and do the chain rings they're back to normal but mm. yeah i'd be so if i honestly i would i would not buy a bike if i had to run two different chains yeah yeah um it's cool to see it's cool to see that technology on a bike other than Lal though. Like it's good to see yeah. Nikolai has picked it up. It's an interesting bike, that's for sure. Nikolai's always been that brand that is like I remember there was a guy where I grew up who used to import them and, and they always look cool. Like they always look cool, but they're always so quirky. And I would I wouldn't ever want to ride one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like, but they're cool. Like I really appreciate what they're doing and they're obviously stuck. You know, they've got their brand guideline and they're stuck to it. I think that's awesome. But yeah, I know there's always a little bit too quirky for me. Yeah, mm. that derailleur system is cool. I, I like, same thing, right? Like just thinking outside of the box. Like why does the derailleur sit down there like to catch sticks? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I think uh, that's it because I'm hungry and tired and old. So, yeah, have you guys got anything I'll... else you wanted to touch on? Nah. Uh, if you got a really no. shock that's rock shock and you don't know how to set up, go on Trailhead. Yes. Because they do really shocks now and I think it's amazing. That's not because I work for the brand. I just think it's cool. I think, like, just in general, Trailhead is really good for people. It's to such, an under, such an underutilized tool, like on forks. You know, I think from the shop guy just setting up a fork for a customer, it's perfect. To you know, me the other day when I got when I got a new pike, like I, I literally just used that guy to set it up, hmm. just to get a baseline. You know what I mean? Like then you're just not fucking swinging a saw around the woods, like which is cool. But the rear shock thing is is good because you know there's not a lot of tools out there for rear shocks um, because the thing is hard. I mean, whoever did that project for Rock Shock, like hats off because like. Oh. Fuck that, it, yeah. It's not a case of just going like like a fork is easy, right? Because a fork to fork and it's a travel length and off it goes. But the um the rear shocks, like there's you know, you can have one shock that has, you know, in, infinite amounts of different travel lengths, you know, but a lot. So um yeah, hats off to them. But if you're trying to play with shocks and you want to set it up, go on that, it's really good. And if you need a coil spring calculator for the new shocks, also go on that because it works. Yeah. Well, to circle back to the <clears throat> to the very beginning of the conversation, but kind of on a similar type of point, yeah, I'm really, really excited to ride one of the new coils too, with the hydraulic bottom out, because, yeah, I reckon that'll be insane. I've ridden no, an EXT with your hydraulic shit. bottom out. It's unreal. I, um, I was saying uh, to Triffin, who's the new stew guy, who's fucking awesome, but I was like, these would be so cool to have on the stew bikes. The only thing that'd be hard is getting a spring for everyone. But, yep. you know, if someone's a medium, they're not going to change too much. But there's way more on, on the track you can do with that shock than you can changing an air, air shock because you can't change tokens out on the track easily. Um, yep. The changes are crazy. And to be honest, like from the feeling difference I've had on that, like I reckon if you went to Gnarly with the adjustments on of the certain bikes, like you'll start blowing wheels up. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a World Cup mechanic that did mention that happens with progressive springs. Yeah, right. Because yeah, I get I get what he's saying now. Like I'm starting to understand, like, because that ramp in G forces is so hard. It yeah. just it'll just go. So Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And if you got a new yeah, if you're looking at a new shot, go coil. <laughs> <laughs> you got eye bottom right now, so there's no no point. Yeah, well, that's kind of half the reason I brought it up. Like I um I rode Red Hill on Saturday. Um, hats off to the Red Hill crew too. Like it's oh, been a while Sunday. since. Like, yeah, I know you were. I should have hit you up. John, you drove crew. past my you drove past my house. Yeah. Oh really? Oh. I've been to your house there. before, but it was in the middle of the night. I couldn't bloody remember where it was. But um, actually, no, well, I wouldn't have gone past your house because I took the ferry. Oh, fuck yeah. yeah. Was it very nice? It was you very windy. You can your missus's joke. Um, um, why anyway, is there a ferry to get from one? Isn't it barren all the way across Melbourne? That's sick. No, well, there's a ferry. Awesome. Like, 
Okay. Because like where I live is on the on the west side of the bay, where Lockie lives on the uh, east side of the bay. Yeah. So it's like a two hour drive around, but you can fucking see it. Like from my kitchen window, I can see Lockie's house. <laughs> <laughs> just a massive well, telescope away. in your front window. <laughs> um, but the ferry's kind of cool because it, it's still two hours, but it doesn't feel like two hours because it's like half an hour, uh, then a ferry is half an hour, then another half hour with the peripheral type of shit. But, yeah, it feels a lot closer. But in any case, I hadn't ridden my meta for a while. I'm not doing a heap of riding at the moment, but I um, hadn't ridden my meta in a while, but I had ridden my Supreme the weekend before. And the Supreme always just kind of feels natural. I think, like, I don't know, it's uh, – anyway, it just kind of feels good. But the meta felt fine other than the rear end just felt like a bunch of shit. And it always kind of feels a little bit how you going. And I think – I don't know, like, it, it's not huge travel. Like, it's only 140, but the air shock just feels really choppy because mm. – I, that's kind of the best way to describe it. Choppy. I don't know if that makes sense to anyone else, but that's like the most. It's well, like, yeah, I run I it half. So, yeah, I run it half. Coil is so amazing on those. It would be. Well, well, sorry. Traditional coil. I've never ridden it with a traditional coil, but I've, some people have liked them. Some people haven't really liked them, but. I think that that bike with a coil with a hydraulic bottom out would be absolutely amazing because mm-hmm. what that bike struggles with is um, like it, with an air shock, it doesn't really feel very plush, yeah. but then you kind of need to run it with enough PSI that it doesn't blow through because you've only got 140 mil of travel. But so with, and it's not that progressive. So with a, with a traditional coil, I've heard of people blowing through, but I think a coil with hydraulic bottom out on that bike would be the dream. So that's what I'm going to do. I've, um, I've got a few friends with a normal snow gold and they work with it because they are, they're not crazy aggressive. They, they seem to support it. Like, yeah. But, um, I how many tokens have, have you got in that? Uh, I've got three tokens. Yeah. See, I'd, I could go like four, four and a half. I did go up and it felt just really choppy. But yeah, okay. Um, yeah, again, like I, I have never ran it with a coil. So mm. um, I, I shouldn't talk from that side of it. I shouldn't just write a coil off. But in any case, just like my own sort of, well, the air's fine. Don't get me wrong. It's just when it gets really rough, is it yeah. kind of gets pretty choppy. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of, I guess I'm exaggerating a bit. Like, it's good, but it's just when you, you really push it that it can't seem to handle it. But in any case, yeah, I really want to try a coil with a hydraulic bottom out because I think it would get the best of both worlds. Having ridden one before, I think it would be really good. Mm. They're not expensive either. Like, that's the thing that blew me away when they, because we sold that shot. I'm actually happy to have spent $900 on that shot. Yeah, I um, they had one over at uh, what's at Chainbrain. Oh yeah, but they probably wouldn't sell it to you. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> oh, they kids. So they've got they're doing propane now, and so they're hanging on to a lot of those. So they've got like eighteen sets of Zebs and a oh, fuckload. I noticed shops. that they're That's not so selling much shit. They're not selling a lot of them because they're hanging on to them for builds. Oh, yeah, okay. But in any case, it was the first they might, time. If you call them the might. I think it was the first time I'd seen one of the, the new coils with the hydraulic bottom out. I was like, this is a really nice looking shot. Mm. Yeah, like, they're um, the internals. Like, they're a really, really nice looking product. Yeah, see, whereas I actually don't like the look of the air shock. I don't either. The tapered no, can just shit. Yeah. me off. It yeah. looks like you're rolling your four back. <laughs> <laughs> I actually hate it for another reason that's also I wouldn't say phallic but it's like the HSC looks like it's set of nuts at the top but yeah um, well that too <laughs> yeah but no the, like that shock with like in that bike right now with the little sar spring on it it's so fucking so cute and little and like yeah so oh, too good sweet ass 
Yeah, that's yeah, that's one way to end it for sure. Yeah, I was having a look at mine quickly, but uh, yeah, thick. I'm so tired. Yeah, I don't yeah I'm fucked. It's been a long day. I'm sick. I reckon I've got the flu. There we go. Hope you enjoyed that kind of random all over the place episode where we just talk shit for an hour and a half hour or so. Thanks to our sponsors, Trek, FE Sports, NS Dynamics, Taylor Trails, Frank Dertzer for Crush and Fist. And as I mentioned before, our title sponsor, Lead Out Sports. Go and hit them up if you want some of the best tools in the country. As per usual, if you want to support the podcast, jump over to beyondtape.com, grab some merch, support us a little bit financially so we can keep this thing going. If you can't afford that or don't want to give me any of your hard-earned pennies, um, just tell your mum, tell your brother, tell your friends, tell the guy next to you on the train, tell your dog, tell whoever about the podcast, share it around, share it on Instagram, share it via word of mouth and it would be greatly appreciated. That's it for this episode and I can't wait to see you for the next one. And until then, just go and have a bunch of fun.